Hello, and welcome to a very casual ranking of the characters of Twin Peaks. This list contains characters from seasons one and two, as well as Firewalk With Me and The Return. This list was made by the user Kerblaroo, and I will include the link to this in the description if you would like to fill this out and make it for yourself. Before we get started here, I do have some ratings at the top that I'll be using. For characters that I don't like as much, I'm putting them in the D category of Chowder-Headed Yokel. I actually split the C category into two different versions because there are characters who I might have mixed feelings on, and that is C plus A Divided Heart. And there are characters that I just don't have much to say on because they're more or less there for just a reason in the story. They're more of a plot device than a character, or they're not really very in-depth. Uh, that's going to be C- minus manufactured for a purpose. Any character that I like is going to go in B, A, or S. B means I don't need, I want, in that I don't need this character, but I do quite like them. This is a positive rating. A, they're damn good, and S is the gum I like. I am going to be completely subjective with this rating. I'm not rating it on most important characters. I am not rating it on fan favorite characters. I'm rating it on personal favorite characters. So of course, in the comments, I'm interested to read what your personal favorite characters are, but just as kind of a heads up, I might have an unpopular take here or there. We'll find out as we go along. This is all just for fun. And like I said, it's very casual. I'm not aiming this to be concise of any type of sort. I am more or less just trying to have a nice conversation and chill with some Twin Peaks characters, and I'm glad to have you along for this ride. First up, arbitrarily, is Albert Rosenfeld, who I do quite like. Albert, in my opinion, peaked in seasons one and season two, where he was very cynical and jaded and almost sort of sarcastic as a speaker, oftentimes having some of the most memorable one-liners and zinger insults of the series. And then when he came back in The Return, he moderated and mediated a bit. He still had some barbs to throw at Gordon Cole, and he occasionally did have some wit and humor, but that sort of cynicism and doubt that I felt more in season one and season two, I, I didn't feel as much in The Return, and he kind of ended up being more the straight man to Gordon's antics, rather than ex and an eccentric in his own right. Uh, for me, the standout Albert moment probably is going to be his interactions with uh, Sheriff Truman, in particular the, of course, moment where he brings up being a disciple of Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi, a follower of peace, and proclaiming his love for Truman. I think that's that's probably the, the most memorable moment because Albert always existed on this edge of kind of contradiction at that point where he could be one of the meanest and kind of nastiest characters on the good guy team because, you know, like as Ed is talking about his story of what happened to Nadine, he's over here suppressing a chuckle and not really sympathizing as much, generally has a disdain for small town life. But then on the other hand, we find out that he is a pacifist. He is someone who advocates for peace. And I think that kind of gives him a nice little complexity. I am right now, at least, going to put Albert in the I don't need, I want category, but I might decide later to move him up to damn good if I feel like that's where the list is kind of going at that point. Next up is Andrew Packard. He, this is a character that appears pretty late into the show, but is forecasted and foreshadowed earlier on. There's this idea that he was blown up in this boating incident or might have died, but then is revealed to be alive. And he's okay. He's kind of got some fun moments. He, I think the, the actor does a good job um, portraying him with a sense of kind of irreverent wit and uh, coy nature that makes him play off of Catherine really well. And uh, I don't know if necessarily he's a sympathetic character, but he is one that straddles this line between, you know, are we supposed to root for him? Are we supposed to root against him? In some of the supporting material, like if I remember correctly in the access guide, he is proclaimed to be kind of a town hero. Like he is considered a good person by the town standards, but he also seems very conniving and dangerous. Not really much better than Thomas Eckert himself. I not really feeling as strongly about Thomas Eckert as I am Albert Rosenfeld, so I'm going to put him in C plus for a divided heart. I guess my negative, I would say, is that he's not a very explored character. He definitely is more than just a bit player, but I don't really have as much to say about him. I think he complements the scenes that he's in, but rarely is the strongest element in any given scene. Next up is Andy Brennan. 
a character that I'm assuming is definitely a fan favorite. I think that he has some fun slapstick moments in the original series. Um, I'm thinking of that one where the board hits him on the head and he kind of stumbles back. In, in that particular instance, we saw some good character acting on the part of Harry Goaz. And I do like some of his back and forth with Dick Tremaine. Uh, some of his moments with Lucy are either sweet or kind of comedic. Uh, seeing him get stuck with a bunch of tape or working on a spelunking. There's some fun storylines. That said, I'm not as crazy about his role in The Return where he is brought by the firemen to be this sort of tool for the storyline to progress. I think that his moments with Wally Brando are quite fun, or I should say moment singular is quite fun and memorable. There's a great, again, sense of pride on the actor's face. Harry Goa is doing some really good work there. I'm going to put Andy in the I don't need, I want category. And you know what? While I'm going through this, I'll just kind of place them where I think they would be from left to right. So I like Albert more than Andy. So I'm going to put Andy to the right. Further left means I like them more within that category. So I'll just try to do that as we're going along just to save myself and maybe you guys some time at the end of this. Next up is Annie Blackburn. A character who also did not have a lot of time in the original series and unfortunately did not come back for the return, although she is featured in the final dossier. I quite like Annie. I, I think my biggest point of confliction would be that I would have wanted more with her. I either wish she would have been introduced earlier in the show or that the show had had more time with her. Of course, if we would have got that season three in the 90s, maybe Annie would have played a more prominent role there. But as things stand, I think she has some really good chemistry with Dale Cooper, with Kyle MacLachlan, and I do believe in their relationship. I think it is pretty cute, actually, and pretty endearing, while at the same point being dangerous and something that obviously is going to haunt Cooper and haunt Annie in its ramifications. I think that Annie's stance as someone who got released recently from the convent and just is new to the world and trying to experience things it's quite compelling i think it's fun i think it fits into twin peaks and i think her relationship with norma is pretty strong and that's one area that i feel there are parts in the final dossier that help strengthen that and i do believe that they would be especially close so i actually do like annie quite a bit and i'm hesitant right now if i want to put in b or a I think I'm going to put for right now her at the front of B. I do enjoy some of her stuff more than Albert, which I mean maybe is a wild take because definitely Albert has more content. But I just think Annie's a really fun character and someone I would want to see more of, whereas Albert, I'm like, I think I think I saw the right amount. I don't, I don't feel myself needing more Albert personally. Next is Anthony Sinclair. Uh, he plays a relatively minor role in The Return. And, you know, I, as I'm saying this, I'm like pretty sure his name is Anthony. And if there's characters that we get to that I say the wrong name or I misunderstand, I'll, I'll try to make a little annotation on the screen or end up like putting a comment later. Feel free to point that out if I make a mistake, either pronunciation or list the wrong character. But with Anthony, he's someone that I think was manufactured for a purpose. The actor does a good job. I think that the moment with the dandruff brushing is kind of a memorable moment for Dougie. But at the end of the day, I really can't say much about Anthony's personality other than that he is someone who is a bit afraid and cowardly of these commitments to these evil sides and a bit internally conflicted and ultimately like repents kind of in this moment. I, I think he's fine. I think again, the actor does a good job, but there isn't much really for me to say beyond that particular aspect. Next is Audrey Horn, a pretty huge character. In the original show, she's actually not there that much. And when I look back on it, I kind of realize that Audrey is a character of diminishing return, uh, not return pun intended, in that in the original show, she starts off great. Um, she's kind of a mischief maker at the Great Northern, constantly toying with her father's business interests. And the more you dive into her character, I think the more that you can start peeling back layers of why she's like that necessarily, why she's doing this to her father's business and taking such delight in it. And then she begins to investigate her father, potentially as either the killer of Laura Palmer or someone involved in the process. And even though there's still kind of that gleeful, chaotic energy to Audrey, she's also uncovering some really dark and damaging things about her father and the implications that has for Laura Palmer as well. Learning about One-Eyed Jacks, getting kidnapped by John Renault. I think that's one of the highlights of the whole series is that stuff with, uh, with John Renault. And I think that Audrey 
while a very strong character, I think she does work for a temporary damsel in distress because I think that she was getting in over her head. I think she was a character that was putting herself in really dangerous situations and didn't quite know what to do about it. And I don't think um, I don't think it's surprising at all that she ended up in the situation she was. However, I do think that the character kind of doesn't really have much direction after that point in the original show. In season two, she has a few small plot lines where she's with her father uh, during like the Civil War uh, psychological breakdown episode. She's there. She has a flirtation with Bobby that never quite really ran anywhere for me. And then when you get to the return, she becomes this rather strange character that I'm really conflicted about because I think on one hand, the stuff that we get with her with like the reality distortion and the, the, the stuff that happens with Audrey's dance in the roadhouse is really interesting, compelling stuff and great for theory fodder. And I think she definitely has a standout storyline, but the scenes with Charlie just go on and on and on. And I don't think they're particularly, at least for, for me personally, very enthralling. Um, so I, I end up kind of feeling mixed about Audrey's role in the return because I like the boldness of it but I don't really care for the minutia of the conversations that happen with Charlie. And of course, in all of this, I forgot to mention like her ending in season two, where she has the weird John Justice Wheeler storyline, which definitely feels thrown in there. Although I do think there's a defense for John Justice Wheeler that if she was looking up to Dale Cooper as this man of mystery and intrigue and something or someone bigger than the town of Twin Peaks, someone from outside, I think that we do see some of those similar traits in John Justice Wheeler. It's only someone closer to her age, perhaps. And then at the end, she gets in that bank explosion and the rest is either, depending on how you want to interpret it, in the secret history or in another parallel universe. Overall with Audrey, I am conflicted, but I think it would be dishonest for me to put him in the, put her in the same category as, uh, as Mr. Andrew Packard. I think instead I'm going to put her in the I don't need, I want category at the head of it. And again, maybe I'll move characters to A later, but I have enough reservations with Audrey where I just think there's missed potential. I do not think that she should have ended up with Dale Cooper because I feel that at the end of the day, it didn't make sense, at least to my viewing, that Dale Cooper, an FBI agent, would be seeing a high school girl while investigating the death of a high school girl. I just didn't think that was going to happen. Even if the show lasted long enough for her to officially graduate, I still think the moral implications are a little tough there. Regardless, Sherilyn Fenn's performance, even when the writing wasn't necessarily uh, consistent with her character, I think Sherilyn Fenn was always a captivating presence on the screen, especially in the original series where she became so iconic. Obviously, the fashion of Audrey, the style of Audrey uh, is very emblematic of a lot of things that people appreciate about the look of Twin Peaks. Next is Becky, Becky Briggs or Becky Burnett, I believe. I think Becky, I, I hate to say it, is somewhere in between manufactured for a purpose and, and maybe uh, I don't need, I want, because I'm going to put her in the manufactured right now while I talk at least. Becky is a very interesting character when she's on screen. I think that Amanda Seyfried does a great job with what she's given, but this was a character that I thought could have been so much more and w despite a very strong introduction and some good moments with her family, ultimately is not really a key power player. I think that if the return was more like the original series, we could have seen more of Becky as potentially like a new character equally as important as Bobby or Shelley in the original, but she just doesn't get that screen time or that amount to flourish. So I, I am kind of hesitant to really say again much about her personality or endeavors, other than that, I think it's well-performed, and that scene where she's in the car staring up at the sky is very visually engaging, and there's not really a, a bad moment necessarily. So so maybe 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 I will move her up um, from the manufactured for a purpose into the I don't need, I want category uh, simply because of the strength of the performance aspect. And I would want to see more of her, so I think that that's a fair, a fair reason to bump her up. Next is Benjamin Horn, who is going straight into S tier for me personally. I really, really like Benjamin Horn, specifically in the original series. 
I think that Richard Boehmer has such a charismatic and interesting presence on the screen, waxing poetic with, you know, references to Shakespeare and uh, old timey poetry as he's musing a high lofty ideals, but also running these nefarious organizations, planning these horrible plots and associating with the likes of Leo Johnson and Hank. And I think that there's so many interesting layers then to Ben as he's going back and forth with Catherine or having the strained relationship with his family, or even later when he's having the heart to hearts with John Justice Wheeler, whether you take him to be sincere or not, whether you read the final dossier to be indicating that Ben was lying or you take the original series for its word and that he meant the truth. And that whole stuff with Dr. Hayward, I think that comes to a head Ahead in the fireplace, of course, and that to me was a great culmination of his character. There were, of course, some elements that maybe are not as great. I think the obvious elephant in the room would be the Civil War arc with Ben. I have read reports, I, I don't remember which book it was in, but I've, I've read reports that uh, people do interpret that the Civil War arc was there because of the very popular Civil War documentary at the exact same time Twin Peaks was happening, and it may have been influenced by that. And I, I think you can still rationalize why it's there, that this is a man who is trying to reclaim his power, reclaim his glory by, you know, either reversing the uh, the outcome of the Civil War or accepting defeat. And, like, it's an internal struggle made manifest outward. But it isn't great. And I think that there are some definite elements you can object to um, with its portrayal of the, the Civil War arc and especially the South. But outside that particular moment, I think Ben Horn is such a mover and a shaker for multiple storylines and has great dynamics with multiple characters. Like, there's just moments where it's him and Hank having power struggles that are really engaging to watch. Stuff with Jerry is really engaging to watch. I just think that um, there's so many interesting moments with him that really stand out when I look back on the show. And he's just a fun villain. Like, he's... The kind of antagonistic, skeevy sort of guy that you know is up to no good, but he is always interesting and always intelligent about it. So I, I really do like Benjamin Horn and in all of his warts and all. In The Return, he's a quieter character. Um, I do think that he didn't need to be very much in The Return. I think this is a man who has kind of accepted that he isn't going to be doing all these ambitious giant plans anymore that he's kind of quieted down over the years. And we do sense a fracture within his family that's happened in the final dossier. There is an evidence that he had been giving money to the Hayward family to help raise Gersten Harriet. So I think there's just multiple dimensions going on while that's happening. He's also not wanting to keep giving Sylvia Horn money, his, his former wife for, Johnny. So I think, again, he's just a layered character. Even in The Return War, he's more muted. Really, really do enjoy Benjamin Horn. Next up is Betty Briggs. And, and I feel kind of bad about this because I, I think I have to put her in manufactured for a purpose. Not because I think she's a bad character. I, I think she's quite good. I think that her connection to her husband and kind of loyalty to him, especially in The Return, she's actually a bit stronger, I think, because she's given more time to shine. But I don't think there is as much really with Betty Briggs to analyze or dive into. So I, I think she is ultimately more just there as kind of a background character. I do enjoy in the pilot when she has like the scissors next to the phone cord and seems potentially shady. Um, there's some, I think it was, I want to say it was a missing piece where her and her husband are, uh, they're, they're reading parts of the Bible. I want to say it was revelation. There's some interesting moments, but it's not really enough for me to have a strong feeling one way or the other. Um, I generally like Betty Briggs, but I don't find myself really thinking or dwelling much on her character other than when she's on screen, I guess I would say. Next is Beverly, who is definitely manufactured for a purpose. I think the performance is fine. I think that the interactions with Ben are fine. The ringing is very mysterious, of course. There's that one-off scene where she's with her husband who is dying, and that is potentially interesting, although that plot line does not really continue or build. So for me, Beverly is one of the many characters of The Return that populate scenes and in the moment are fine, but don't really build or culminate too much particularly. 
Next is Blackie, who I would say is not really a very strong presence, but I, I'm going to put her in the I don't need, I want, because I do enjoy what little we get of Blackie. This is where you're already maybe starting to see my certain biases come in through for seasons one and season two over the return. Blackie, by all accounts, is not more of a character than Becky right? But I hesitated to put Becky here and yet put Blackie here immediately. And, and I don't know if it's because I had more time with seasons one and season two, or if it's because of the kind of role that Blackie has is such a very pronounced villainous role. But I think she is engaging and interesting. The scene with uh, Audrey with the cherry, I think is obviously met, remembered for Audrey, but Blackie's intimidation factor is definitely important here. I think having this woman in charge of One-Eyed Jax creates another interesting power dynamic with Benjamin Horn. And her interactions with Jean Renault, albeit very brief, are also pretty engaging as well. Next is Bobby Briggs, who I'm going to put straight into S tier as well, alongside Benjamin Horn. I think Bobby is one of the most successful characters in all of Twin Peaks. Every material that he gets placed in is just consistently so good. You know, in fact, I'm going to put him ahead of Ben, I think, at least for right now. I, you know, this is one of those things that ask me a week from now, I could change my mind. But I think Bobby just is so strong. Dana Ashbrook does a great job, whether it's the younger, more rebellious and passionate Bobby or the older, a little bit more, I don't want to say forlorn, but I don't know if that's the right word. I'm just kind of saying a word, but a little quieter as a lot of characters in the return are, but more mellowed out by, you know, experience, age, um, what's happened with his family, what's happened with his father, having kind of faced some dark times, one can presume. But I think that Dan Ashbrook does a great job with both iterations of the character. And so even in like the other supplementary material, like Fire Walk With Me, Bobby is really engaging. That strut backwards with uh, with the Angelo Badalamenti song is great. The stuff in Laura's diary is really good. Like I think the Bobby content in the diary is some of the best stuff in the diary there. Laura's connections to him and how she views him is pretty complicated and interesting. And in the return, Bobby is one of the only returning characters from the original series that has a pretty definite arc and progression. Um, some of it is implied, you know, you kind of set the read between the lines of like, why would he become a law enforcement officer? My headcanon, I suppose, would be that he might have been trying to protect and uh, help people like himself or Laura and growing up to be a law enforcement officer is maybe a way that he thought he could do that, be kind of a symbol of goodness, even though it doesn't seem like the police are actually able to do that. Uh, the Bookhouse boys aren't able to fight the darkness. Clearly the darkness keeps coming back and the police aren't able to stop the importing of drugs or even stop people like Steven or his own daughter from falling into the hands of these sort of uh, criminal elements or becoming addicted to these drugs. But I think Bobby is a character who keeps trying in the return. And there's a real poetry to the way that he tries to be there for Becky, similar to how his father had been there for him with that incredible moment in the diner with that speech. And Bobby is always a character full of nuance that when you first meet him, he seems like this bombastic, ridiculous kind of sarcastic character. I mean, I never thought of him as a jock, but he is supposed to be the football jock. And he's, you know, a popular guy at school, seems pretty jaded, seems pretty aggressive. He's friends with Mike Nelson and they go around and, you know, cause fights at the bar at the roadhouse. But when you peel back the layers, like the scene with Jacoby where he's like crying with Jacoby or at the, uh, the funeral where he says some of the most interesting lines in the whole series about how everyone is to blame for the death of Laura Palmer, that he called out everyone, including himself for all of that. I think Bobby has so many points where he's like spot on and the love he has for Shelly is one of the most genuine, healthy relationships in the series. And obviously like he flirts with Audrey, not his best hour. And uh, it takes Gordon Cole to snap him out of that, I guess. But I think Bobby is pretty consistent. I think Bobby is, is really good. And I never really grow tired of him as a character. I think that he, of a lot of the young characters in Twin Peaks, is probably the strongest or one of the strongest. So I'm going to, yeah, comfortably say he's the gum I like. Next is Bob, who... 
I mean, one could say is literally manufactured for a purpose or hatched for a purpose, depending. Uh, barfed out for a purpose uh, by the Jowde or the demon from part eight. Who, who's to say? But I, I can't deny how iconic Bob is. I'm trying to my do my best right now to separate Bob from being the same character as Leland. But there's just obviously such an incredible presence to Frank Silva's performance in the original series. The crawling over the couch, the role that he played with Leland killing Maddie, the individual moments uh, are fantastic. Even the what happened to Josie kind of taunting is great. The only part where maybe it wasn't so great, in my opinion, was the international pilot where he has a lot more talking lines and uh, he's just kind of a guy in a basement. That, that felt a little weird. But everything else uh, is, is superb stuff. And he's, he's quintessential. Like, you can't have Twin Peaks without Bob. Uh, I, I just, uh, what is there even to say? So I'm going to put Bob in the damn good category. I think that whenever there's a moment with Bob on screen, I am visually arrested. I am very much on board to see what is going to happen. I have obviously am obligated to say right now I do not care for the Bob Blob punch out fight in the return. I, I know people have their own reasons for liking it either ironically or unironically. But for me, that was a part that didn't quite feel right, didn't quite mesh right for what Bob is and for what Twin Peaks is. But I don't really hold that against Bob so much. I mean, he's even having a good time in that ball. So I really don't hold it against him. And, and of course, I'm laughing out of all this stuff because, you know, Bob is just this very over-the-top kind of caricature of evil. But there are genuinely chilling moments with just the character in the diary or in Fire Walk With Me where he is obviously being used as an analog for some of the most evil things that happen in our world. And it actually works, I think. I think it's really dangerous when you try to use supernatural parts to explain real-world evil. You, you could run the risk of trivializing the real thing. But I think Bob never feels that way. At least, at least not to me. It, it never felt like it was, you know, dodging the serious parts of the implications of Twin Peaks by using Bob, but more that Bob became a way to talk about things which are otherwise hard to talk about. Whether it's the evil that men do, if you want to think of it that way, or something even more primal or cosmic than, than that sort of descriptor could entail. I think Bob is one of the characters people are always going to associate with Twin Peaks, and I think that's for very good reason. And when people think of Twin Peaks The Return, they may think of the Mitchum brothers, so let's go ahead and talk about, I believe this is Bradley Mitchum. I may or may not have had to look that up to be 100% sure. So Bradley Mitchum, played by Jim Belushi, is very fun. He is very silly as a character. I mean, there's a sort of quiet menace when he is meant to be more of a threatening antagonistic character. But a lot of his role in the series of The Return is this sort of semi-comedic role alongside his brother. They have a great chemistry together. And that, that moment where there's the pie dream and Jim Belushi gets to make these great facial contortions and great reactions, it's some very fun stuff. I'm going to put him in the B category. I do not think that I am as attached to him as I am with Audrey or Annie or even Albert for that matter. But I, I do think that the comedy moments for me land a bit better with the Mitchums than they do with Andy sometimes. So I'm going to go ahead and at least for right now, put him above Andy in that very large category that B is starting to become. Next is the battling bud himself. Mr. Bushnell Mullins, who I think has some good moments with Dougie. I think the actor did a very good job with the role. Uh, it is not a character, however, that I feel an especial attachment to. I'm going to put him right below Betty Briggs. With even less lines is Candy, who I, for a lot of, for a lot of fans and myself, I don't know why we all like her. I, I do quite like Candy. I think that some of the comedy with her, obviously the fly scene with the remote was great. Uh, just some of the sort of absent-minded dreaminess of the character is very fun. I, I am going to put her... 
I'm I'm gonna put her above Blackie. Am I gonna put her above Becky though? Hmm. I, I don't think I don't think I am. Even though Candy is is quite a bit of fun, I, I think that Becky has a bit just more going on. Um, that that makes me want to see more of Becky's character and and evolve that character more. Carl Rod, played by the late great Harry Dean Stanton is a really memorable character from Fire Walk With Me uh, with his fat trout trailer park and the sort of curious nature of him where he talks about how he's he's been to places he doesn't he wants to stay put now we don't quite know all that entails then later with the secret history he is kind of retroactively looked at as potentially a person who had been abducted by aliens and has a lot of linkages to Margaret Lannerman and we see in the return him having a very spiritual connection where it seems like he's able to perceive things that are a bit otherworldly a symbol of compassion very much who I think even though you know screen time wise isn't very big in the return I think he definitely leaves a mark so I'm gonna put Carl Rod in the again big B category where I think I like him more than Blackie I like him more than Candy. You know, I might even like him more than Becky. So I'll put him over here uh, in, in that sort of area on B. Now, next up, I am seeing what I think is Carrie Page. But I do need to double check because Laura Palmer looks like she's down over here. So this is just Carrie Page. Whatever we take that to be. And this is a hard one because... Of course, Cheryl Lee is fantastic, and the scream that she emits at the end of part 18 is phenomenal and terrifying and haunting. And Carrie Page is an interesting character. I, I want to know why there's the dead man in her chair. I want to know what the white horse and the black plate and all that stuff, what it means. I want to know why her name is Carrie Page when we still have a page of the diary maybe unaccounted for. Of course, all of these questions about who and what she is are abound. But with how little we get of her and how much is uncertain, I, I'm kind of grasping to try to figure out what I feel because you know thinking ahead to characters that are going to be on here later you know I'm going to be looking at the experiment over here and somewhere along here is probably Pierre and the Traymon there's there's Nido or Nato over here so I think we're going to be looking at characters that are very unknown and mysterious throughout this process so I, I think they can't all just go into manufactured for a purpose, I think. I, I think that I do have to look at, like, how I feel about this character and if they are something or someone that I feel an especially strong way about to elevate them more than just their base appearance. Carrie Page is hard, though, because even by saying that, I think a lot of her weight is because of the casting and is because this looks like Laura Palmer and maybe Laura Palmer. If this character was a totally new casting and wasn't associated with Laura Palmer, there'd be nothing to say. The The whole entire purpose and mystery of this character is, is who and what is she because she looks an awful lot like Laura Palmer. And, and by that virtue, I think almost all of her appeal and weight comes from a different character, who, again, might be a different character. So maybe you can start to hear my anguish and uncertainty that I'm going to put her in the sea for manufactured for a purpose. And I, and I guess I'm going to put her below Betty Briggs, but I don't know if that's where she's going to remain this whole entire time. And, and I could be convinced maybe by you in the comments, if you think that this is a bad placement. I feel a bit more confident putting Catherine Martell though in, in pretty strong graces in the, uh, the B category. I, I think that, She's a very fun character in the original series. She has some great back and forths with her husband, Pete, as well as with Ben, her on and off again trading partner and rival, as well as Josie. And she's consistently really good in those scenes and very fun. I, I will admit that when I first watched Twin Peaks, I wasn't 100% sure of what her angle was or what her ideas were. And what was the whole plot with the mill? But as I as I kept going back, it made more sense, and it's always fun to chew on. It's fun, very soap opera-y elements that kind of play in with her character. And uh, I think that she has some interesting arcs and nuances where she's obviously 
cold and very aggressive at points, firing that poor man at the, the lumber mill just for being there. But also we do see her having moments with tenderness. Uh, I think that the Tojimura incident is a bit unfortunate. I, I'm curious if we'll see Tojimura as a separate character here. I, I don't think we, we will, but maybe he is a separate character. That That's a bit unfortunate, obviously, for, for what that is. But if I, if I remove myself from why I might object to it content-wise, it is quite funny, right? It is quite funny that she would pretend even on set to be this character who doesn't seem quite right. Like, there's something weird about him. And uh, the whole making out with Pete thing to reveal the identity was was quite a way to do it. As well as the, the foot incident, I think, with Ben, if I'm remembering correctly, that was also quite engaging and entertaining. So they, I think Catherine just kind of has hits, and, and I think she's a lot of fun. And if, you know, if I move Audrey up to A, maybe I'll move Catherine up to A at the same time. We'll, we'll see. Um, weirdly enough, I'm actually going to put Chad in A tier, which is, which is weird because I don't normally think of Chad when I think of Twin Peaks before Audrey. Audrey's a way bigger character, but I feel like Audrey's got those low points. Audrey's got those sort of elements where it's like they really didn't know what to do with her character in season two, and then I mixed on her in The Return. Whereas Chad in The Return is just a really simple idea executed extraordinarily well. You meet the guy, and he just emits this very strong, ugh, kind of, presence where it's like you you want to punch this man and he just is so good at that he he's just this guy who's always having to make remarks always having to quip and the scene where he he goes into the the sheriff's room or whatever with the food and they're like we you know chad we told you you can't eat in here and he just takes so long to leave and is so grumpy about it and then they have to open a window because the smell of the food but then they leave anyway because they actually have to go outside for their clue chad is weirdly comedic i think that there's some poetic justice to the end of his character of course he's nothing you know extraordinarily special in terms of the storyline or plot but i just think he's so fun to hate he's so consistently well utilized that uh that i have to say i really enjoy him maybe more than a lot of the characters who are a bit again more mixed like you know if you were to count numerically the amount of fun audrey scenes or great audrey moments it probably is a higher number than the amount of chad just by virtue of there being less chad but there isn't a moment really where i'm like oh no chad's bad in this scene no he's 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 doing he's doing what he needs to for every scene he's in and i i quite like that kind of character as being this really dislikable character chantal's also pretty good um, I'm, I'm split. I think she's a little lower for me than, than, than Blackie. Um, just at the moment, at least. And, and maybe, maybe the hard part is that Chantal on her own isn't very much. The same way that Hutch on his own isn't very much. It's when you have them together, like Hutch and Chantal together, I like more than Blackie. So maybe just preemptively, I will put... Chantal above Blackie, I might as well go find Hutch. Because I feel like you can't really talk about one without the other very much. I, I really enjoy Tim Roth as a performer. Maybe that's why I have a slight bias for him, I suppose. But I also feel like Chantal's got some interesting dynamics with Mr. C that happened kind of early on that are worth noting. But uh, but they're they're great combo um, with probably the funniest death in all of Twin Peaks, which I, I don't know how many other uh, deaths are meant to be funny, but I think Hutch and Chantal have a great one. I, I, I do wish there could have been maybe more of them in the return because I think that they were consistently funny and there maybe could have been more of an angle. But as just like hired killers... They're good. They are good. And in fact, you know, I might, hmm, I might have to keep Candy above them just because of that remote controller scene. But they're they're pretty close, I would say, in terms of, of categorization for me. Next is Charlie, who I don't really like. And this is nothing against the performer. It's more just what his character is in the script. He seems to be Audrey's husband. If we're going off of the final dossier... He was like an accountant or something, but it also never says that it is Charlie, so maybe it's not. Some of the framing on him makes it seem like maybe he's meant to be this either supernatural or not really their character. Some people suspect he's like Audrey's therapist or something. I don't know what he's supposed to be. 
Um, but I don't really get a lot of enjoyment out of the scenes with him. And I'm not saying he's any worse than Audrey in those scenes. In fact, I think Audrey's kind of constant berating is harder for me to get through than Charlie's responses. But Audrey also has other stuff that's so good that kind of balances it out for me. So I'm going to put, you know, Charlie here as a chowder-headed yokel. Um, again, nothing against the performer at all, just my own experiences of the scenes that he's in. Certainly not a chowder-headed yokel as Chet Desmond, who I've warmed up to over time. I was a bit more, I don't know, like ambivalent or indifferent toward him in the past, but I do like how he portrays a different sort of agent than Dale Cooper. Um, from what I understand, originally the script supposedly was going to have more Dale Cooper than Kyle MacLachlan didn't want to be typecasted. So they end up writing in Chris Isaac's character and then Dale Cooper actually did return. So did part of the role for Kyle MacLachlan creating this new character that is in fire walk with him basically only. And he's fun. He's got a nice calm demeanor. I think that his interactions with Sam Stanley are quite memorable. And his, you know, fight with Sheriff Cable and moments with Sheriff Cable are also quite engaging there as well. The sort of way, again, he pokes and prods at Sam Stanley is is interesting. So I'm, I'm going to put him there. I like him a little bit more than Blackie, but maybe not as much as the Hutch and Chantal duo. Uh, Valhalla is calling my name because we have Judge Sternwood. The fact that I remember Sternwood's name but had to hesitate on some of the other people from The Return, again, uh, says my biases. I like him. This guy does not matter. He was set up to maybe be more important than he really is. But in, in terms of like wise older characters in the town or the town area, he is no Major Briggs. He is no Margaret Lannerman. He's not even a Carl Rod. He is just kind of this fun, quirky guy who likes Yukon sucker punches and has some banter with Dale Cooper. I, I do enjoy him. I think I'm going to put him over in the B category, which just is stretching along to the right at the moment. Then there is the doctor. I think her name is Constance, if I want to be guessing. She is fun in the little bit we get of her with Albert. I, I think the date scene is, is a little cute. I'm going to put her in Manufactured for a Purpose, uh, right there between Bushnell Mullins and Anthony Sinclair. The army representative in The Return... I do not recall much about her name. I think that she was fine where she was. I, I suppose I like her kind of characterization a little bit more than Beverly's, but it wasn't something that, again, built toward any sort of big conclusion or, or arc. She had a simple role in the story of finding out what happened with Major Briggs, going to this location where the body was found, and then disappearing very much from the storyline from there. And I think that she did fine at that role. Mr. C is going to S tier for me. He is my favorite character from The Return. Um, I don't expect that to really change anytime soon. Um, as much as I love Dale Cooper, Cal McLaughlin managed to morph himself into this completely cold, callous, terrible figure that isn't the mischievous doppelganger of season two's ending, but instead is this kind of husk, this sort of entity that sucks the life out of everything around him. When he's in a scenes of the characters, the power dynamics are palpable. There's the I don't need, I want speech that happens. Uh, his total menace with Daria in that execution the Renzo scene, the starting positions arm wrestle scene is one of my favorite moments in The Return. I think that Mr. C is just so compelling as a driving force of the story. I think a lot of times he's the most interesting focus character. If we're looking at the different Kyle McLaughlins in The Return, I find myself often more engaged with Mr. C than with Dougie personally. So I, I got to put Mr. C really high up. I think that that moment where he's introduced with that American woman remix and just dismantles that guy at the door, goes in and um, arranges to meet with uh, the, the Ray and Daria for his mission. Even just the quiet menace of him interacting with Andy and other people at the 
Twin Peaks town and the sheriff's department, and clearly there's something wrong. This isn't the right guy. I think maybe if it would have been Sheriff Truman from the original show, if it would have been Harry Truman, that added uneasiness might have been even stronger when he's sitting across from the sheriff rather than someone who never met Cooper in the first place. But I digress. Big Mr. C fan here, uh, as well as a big Dale Cooper fan, who I have to put at the very front of S tier because, spoiler alert, he is my favorite character in Twin Peaks. And I know that's such a rare and unusual take. So quirky. I'm, I'm no, I'm original like that. But no, all jokes aside, I, I, I think it's pretty obvious why someone would like Dale Cooper. I don't encounter a lot of Twin Peaks fans who don't. Even people who might be critical of him as a character who view him as a failed hero or someone who has that white knight complex or view him in a negative light toward his actions with like trying to reverse Laura's fate and such and such. Even if, for people who acknowledge that or kind of look at him negative in the return, I think most people just love him. Like even, even with those things happening, even with some of the other elements in My Life by Tapes, if you consider those canon for yourself, where he obviously has much more of a sexual history than maybe what the original show might have alluded to. You know, he's just an interesting guy. And he's quirky. He's fun. He is someone who brings this presence to the town of Twin Peaks that they never have expected or really seen much like. Like, there's some odd characters in the town of Twin Peaks, but Dale Cooper is, is something different and something really special. I think that there's so many relationships that Dale Cooper has that it's hard to really list all of them. I mean, I think chief among them, his chemistry with Harry Truman. I think that Kyle McLaughlin and Michael Ankeen just were great with each other. While I did not want a romance with Audrey, I think that his connection with Audrey is great. I think he's got great rapport with the Annie character. I think that some of the moments we see with him interacting with characters like Bobby in the pilot is also very strong even if it didn't quite feel like him. Like, pilot Dale Cooper is a lot different than the rest of the series' Dale Cooper. The man contains multitudes, right? A very, uh, maybe Walt Whitman-esque kind of character. And I think that works for him, though. I think that it coalesces in this guy who may be running from the past. Like, he tells Audrey that he has no secrets, but clearly he does. Like, My Life, My Tapes would suggest he does. But even what we hear about Caroline and Wyndham Earl later definitely implies that this man has secrets that maybe things were a bit simpler before he showed up, to paraphrase Jean Renault. So just the ways in which he's so full of light and so full of life and fun, his sort of passion and belief in the dream aspect of things then also balanced with maybe some darker aspects, some more questionable aspects as well. He's a very nuanced, complicated sort of character. I personally really do connect and relate to this sort of fish out of water feeling that he gives away. Um, but also his sort of fun, jokey atmosphere is really quite charming. I find myself enjoying Dale Cooper almost every time I see him. And I think that like you need such an interesting lead to make Twin Peaks work as like a narrative experiment. I, I don't know what the show would be like if you didn't have Dale Cooper. And obvi like, obviously he is kind of a main character, but even in a cast this large, you can remove a lot of these people. And yes, Twin Peaks would change, but it would still be Twin Peaks. I don't know if you can remove Dale Cooper. I don't even know what that would do. I think that if you had Chet Desmond show up as the main investigator and this more serious kind of personality, I think it would change the tone of the entire show, especially the original series for that matter. So for that reason and for many others, I have to put Dale Cooper in the very top spot. I, I, I love the guy. He's, he's always an engaging character. So interesting. Daria, I am going to put in Manufactured for a Purpose. I am going to put her, I don't know, probably last here because she really doesn't have much of a personality. She is just someone who shows up and then is killed. Similar to this guy who I think was like a sheriff or law enforcement guy of some kind. He was mistaken for potentially M.T. Wentz. And uh, I don't know, he's, he's that, I'll put him right there, I guess. He's just a guy at the double R. One of the return um, detectives, I think he was fine. I'll put him there. And then Denise. Uh, Denise, I, I'm going to put Denise in a divided heart at the top. I 
think that the fact that Twin Peaks had any kind of trans representation at all when the show came out is really huge. I mean, I if you argued it was groundbreaking, I, I think that makes sense and I'd probably agree with you. I think that in most media you would encounter, from, from what I understand and maybe what I've seen of movies, a lot of times your cross-dressing characters or transgender characters are your killers, are your weirdos, are your comic relief characters. And for the most part, I don't think Denise is that. However, I found myself on re-watching Twin Peaks a little unsure of what Denise is supposed to be. I wasn't sure if this was a trans character or a cross-dressing male character. Some of the reactions, while not verging on total comedy, I would look at Hawk's like bewilderment at seeing Denise, and that felt a little off. And then in the return, we do get clarity, and you know Denise is you know pretty clearly a character who's trans, and that's great. But then you get Gordon Cole like dead naming her, and she's fine with that, I guess. And you get her calling him out for all of his behavior, but still letting him continue doing what he's doing. And her weird love of being in the FBI, I don't really trust that. I, I don't know what to feel. And even a little bit with like David Duchovny's off-screen comments when we're doing like special features for our podcast. I just don't know how I feel about Denise. I, I love the idea of Denise. I think that there is some fun elements to the character, but maybe she could have been more and and maybe I think that even including her a bit more with some of the books would have been good um which I hesitate to say because I don't know what she would do but like the final dossier I, I think you could add her in there and have her maybe give her own report or something I, I just I find myself wanting clarity on what Denise's feelings and thoughts are um, and, and I don't quite know what that is. So I'm going to put her in divided. I, I do enjoy aspects, but other aspects kind of leave me head scratching. Maybe about as much head scratching as I have for the Brothers Fusco. There's uh, a weird sort of almost Three Stooges energy going on with them that uh, plays for comedy, but also... At the same time, I don't know how to feel about some of that comedy that's happening when like someone's being like tased or hurt off screen and they're just kind of sitting there. Um, they, they don't have much of a role in the story. They're, they're fine, I think, for what they are. I'm going to put them as manufactured for a purpose. I'm going to put them, hmm, probably behind Anthony Sinclair. Um, they're, they're occasionally engaging on the screen, but there isn't really much... Um, for them or about them. I'm not even sure who's who for the Fusco brothers. I remember that being a point of contention in some of the special feature footage for the return of like what even their names are. Like one is just named T. Fusco, I think. Oh, Diane is next. Diane, Diane, Diane. I have to look. Is this the only Diane? I think it is. I don't see the red-wigged Diane anywhere on here. And I just wanted to double check because I didn't know if we're counting her just the Tulpa or if we're also counting her as the original Diane. I believe we're counting her for both. I have to put Diane in the divided heart. I, it's probably one of my first really hot takes on this chart. Anyone who is watching this or listening to this who has followed our podcast uh, might know that I am more of a detractor on aspects of the return, and Diane is one of those characters. So... I'll give an abridged version of why that is here. Basically, I think that Laura Dern is a fantastic performer. I I love her in Inland Empire, especially. And I think she's great in, as Diane. Like, I could not think of a better casting. I think she does so much with what she's given. But what she's given is a bit of a mess to me. Her most signifying, like, trait is that she says F you to people. I don't like that I find it kind of annoying that's entirely subjective other people will find that funny or effective I just find it repetitive I just find it kind of drags down moments and becomes a bit predictable after a while when most of her encounters with Gordon or Tammy or Albert are just a series of FUs so beyond that, I don't really know what to say with her character. I think that there's some really wrenching moments where she's talking about Cooper and the kind of ways in which this doppelganger, Mr. C entity had assaulted her. Very, very heavy subject matter there. 
But when we have that moment where Laura Dern's doing a fantastic job acting, like Laura Dern has to present this idea that she's not even herself. Like she's not herself while also dealing with all that trauma, making it real, but also it's supernatural. Laura Dern does a great job with that. But in that scene where Laura says all this stuff that she was assaulted by Mr. C, that's when the FBI have to shoot her dead and then just quickly move on. Like just basically say like, all right, cool. And then they move on to the next thing. And the actual real Diane, we get so very little of, if, if that's who we're supposed to believe is in part 17 and 18, so very little of this character that I don't really know what to say. I am someone in the original series and kind of the other material prior to the return. I didn't really assume much about Diane. Um, I was someone who, when I first watched the show, thought that maybe Diane wasn't real or, you know, maybe we're not going to see Diane. Like there's that cheeky deleted scene with Fire Walk and they were like, Cooper talks to her off screen, but we don't see her. That's fun. My Life My Tapes does include a little bit about her. And I, I don't really know if I could say it's the same character that we see Laura Dern play in The Return. Um, so much time has passed, though, and one's a tulpa, so you can, you can say it's all fine. But I just don't know really who Diane is other than this tulpa version that I'm sympathetic toward because she obviously, like, carries this pain from Diane's experience of assault. But then she's like an antagonistic character that we have to shoot and she's like a, a tulpa. I just, I'm really not sure how to feel about any of those sort of aspects. So while I think Laura Dern is a great performer, I am ultimately really mixed on Diane. And I, I know this is probably a pretty hot take. Uh, again, I just want to emphasize that I think that the issues aren't with the performance. It's with some more of the broad strokes of the writing for me personally. Donna, speaking of controversial, Donna, what are we going to do with Donna? So I like Donna more than James, and I wasn't always sure of that. But as, I, as I've thought about things, as time has gone on, I think that Donna has a bit more. She has that fantastic scene at the cemetery where she tells Laura, I, they didn't bury you deep enough. If I would have had an F tier on this tier maker, that was actually going to be my F tier was uh, they didn't bury you deep enough. But I think that Donna has some really standout moments there with the Tremon Chalfont stuff with uh, the cream corn. I think some of her stuff with Harold's pretty good, actually. And while I am mixed on the sudden abrupt uh, discussion about her parentage with the Hayward and Horn family. I do kind of warm up to it as time goes on. Even the bad Donna stuff where Donna like dons the sunglasses and tries to be like more edgy. I kind of understand it that this is someone going through a lot of emotions and is taking on parts of Laura or at least her idea of Laura. And that includes some of those things we saw in Fire Walk With Me that Laura was a bit more wild, a little bit more dark. And so Donna adopts some of those. So I'm going to put Donna for my own sake, I guess in the divided heart territory, but at the very top. And you know, it's, it's weird. When I look at like Donna at the top of Divided Heart or Judge Sternwood at the bottom of I Don't Want, I Need, I Don't Need, I Want, I, I kind of don't really know what to say or feel because like, I mean, there are some great moments with Donna that are better than some of the stuff with these B-tier characters on the low end. But also Donna does some things that are so impulsive and so wild that I found her a really hard character to buy into. I think while I'm at it, I should go find James. I, I see his forehead right here. And I'm going to put James under D. I like him more than, I guess, Charlie. But I, I do have to be honest with myself that the more I think about it, while I can find a lot of positive things about Donna's character, I think James needed a lot of workshopping. As he's presented right now, I guess my read on him is that he's this very naive, sort of tender guy who fell in love with Laura, but only in the kind of most general way. Like there's that flashback that's so awkward with him and Laura, where he talks about how her hair smells good or something. And he, he, he seems to believe that Laura cared for him, but we also have Laura literally calling him like an idiot and like insulting him to his face, even while also embracing and, 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 you know, prioritizing him as a person. 
I think James is just really confused and did not really know what Laura was. And, and I think only saw glimpses of that. And in the time that followed, he didn't really get any time to heal. He jumped immediately rebounding into Donna. And while he's with Donna, there was stuff with Maddie, which further confused him. Then Maddie died. He was unable to stop that. And maybe if you head canon it, out of fear of what happened to Laura, what happened to Maddie, he can't be there to really help Donna if anything were to happen. So he ends up leaving. And running from his problems led to him with Evelyn, which one of the more maligned storylines of season two for a lot of people. It's not one of my favorites either, personally. And he ends up like almost being like framed for murder, escapes, and then if we go by the final dossier, is involved with the cartel, has an accident, comes back to Twin Peaks after basically being pardoned through Gordon Cole intervention. But when he comes back to the town, he's lost all that spark and all that drive really to explore or, you know, do much more than just do a simple job, live a simple life. Kind of reminds me of Carl Rod, you know, saying that he's been places, he just wants to stay put now. And the James we see in The Return is a shell, clearly a broken guy. And the James is always cool line. I I can't tell if it was meant to be a joke or not. Uh, For the record, I do not think James was always cool. Uh, I never found James cool as a character from any single point in my viewing, really. And And I say all this to say I don't hate James. Like, I'm putting him in D because I think he's below average. I don't really like him. I think he tends to have some of the weaker scenes. If I were to ascribe like a fix to his character, uh, one of the things that popped when we were doing our podcast was, you know, what, this is at least my inter- my idea here, what if James was more self-aware and kind of realized that what was going on with him and Donna was a bit impulsive? What if he sort of realized Um, kind of inwardly that there was something wrong with what was happening, what he was doing. He never quite fully grasped it, but maybe have a bit more agency to his character so it feels like he's more reflective and more thoughtful of what's going on. And maybe also give him more stuff away from Donna. Maybe have him follow up other leads while she's looking into Harold. Maybe James is talking to the other people that Laura knew. Maybe he's investigating things with Johnny Horn or Josie or just trying to find any connections at the double R with Shelly maybe have some sort of payoff in a big way with Bobby because obviously there's a lot of tension brewing between those characters in season one and then they just kind of let that fizzle I I never felt like they needed to do anything with it but maybe there was some potential for James to grow for James to be more evolved and then have it be clearer that when Maddie dies he is running from these problems because he doesn't believe that he can actually do anything to help people like Donna he can't even help himself and maybe he selfishly leaves for his own safety and for his own security and it kind of just on a whim because he can't handle it anymore but then also I think there's some acknowledgement maybe you could do with why he made that decision considering he doesn't really have much in Twin Peaks as a town anymore he just has Donna and maybe do more with his relationship with Ed and Nadine because as parent figures to him we don't really see much of him with them we just see ed and norma and ed and nadine stuff separately so all this is to say that i think there's things that could have made james a more self-aware more interesting character but the way he comes across in twin peaks feels very unself-aware a little naive and kind of just goes from place to place without a lot of intriguing agency or elements and i think he's a bit of a tragic character but not one that compels me in a meaningful way. Um, (laughs) Speaking of tragic characters, Dougie Jones. Oh boy, Dougie Jones. I'm going to put Dougie Jones below Donna and below Denise, I guess, with a divided heart. I don't know what the consensus is on Dougie. Um, I, I think most people don't hate him. I think, but I definitely was someone watching the return for the first time who was waiting for Dale Cooper to come back and kept expecting it to happen way, way earlier. Like I remember the distinct feeling of being like 11 or 12 parts into the return and that dawning where it's like, if Dale Cooper hasn't come back yet, we really have spent most of the return with Dougie Jones. And sure enough that that is the case. 
And I think his shtick is kind of funny at first, like the whole repeating people around him, kind of just cluelessly bumbling around. The stuff at the casino's good. But as it goes on, it's a lot of the same type of joke over and over again that I don't find as funny after a while. And I find myself just getting more tired of the character than anything else. And so for that reason, I'm going to put him there. And, and I'm looking down over here. Do we have any other version of Dougie? We don't. So I'm going to assume that this Dougie Jones is, um, is going to be the Dougie Jones that Dale Cooper is kind of through. But then I guess we're also ranking the other Dougie Jones, which was manufactured for a purpose to be this other entity. I don't know. I'm going to leave it all where it is, though, I guess in the middle of the C-plus category. And I'm just now realizing, this far in, by the way, that these must have been alphabetical order, huh? Because um, next is the other Dougie, Douglas Milford. Now... If I were ranking this only on the TV show, Douglas Milford would clearly be manufactured for a purpose, and I would probably put him, I don't know, like, maybe maybe here, or, or probably here, yeah. But, and this is, a, this is a pretty big but, what Mark Frost did with him in The Secret History of Twin Peaks is so hilarious. I genuinely love that Dougie Milford. Taking this character who, by all accounts, is one of the most minor characters in the show and turning him into this, like, vastly important center of all these different cases and situations involving, like, top-secret intel, government agencies, and, and having him be, like, the mentor for Major Briggs is absolutely hilarious. And I find his character to be really fun to learn about. He's easily the best part of secret history for me. I have to put Douglas Milford in the damn good category... And I'm going to put him above Chad. And this this is just silly because I'm looking at like putting him above Audrey. But I think that Dougie Milford in the book is so funny and so endearing that I have to. Like, I feel like I have to. <laughs> um, the joke is just too good. Oh, man. What do I even say about Dr. Jacoby? I, I, I've seen a range of opinions. I, I know that... My podcast co-host and I, we were very unsure of this man ethically, morally, uh, finding him very questionable. But then I've seen other people in the community talk about kind of his honesty or sort of the way he always would tell it like it is. And even in Final Dossier, it felt like what we were getting from Tammy was leading to this conclusion that Dr. Jacoby was someone who was a truth teller or, you know, kind of grudgingly got to respect the guy. I don't know how I feel about Dr. Jacoby. This is definitely one character that whenever I rewatch Twin Peaks again, I really want to try to scrutinize and figure out what I feel about him. I do think that the performance is always really fun. I do think that he's an engaging character. I, I think he's like one of the most like interesting to just see interact with other people. And uh, he has some of the most startling changes to his character between the original show and the return, as well as what's added to him in the books. He gets some genuinely great commentary in the books as well. I think I have to put Dr. Jacoby in B somewhere. Um, I suppose, oh, I suppose I like him more than Albert and, and I guess less than Annie for myself, but this is a guy where I do not know what to think or feel. I'm only avoiding divided heart because I do like him. I think he's fun. Even if he makes me confused next up is this man. Uh, I think it's Duncan Duncan Todd. I think is his name. He was manufactured for a purpose. I'll put him here. I think he's, uh, He's got a fun moment or two talking about how you don't want to mess with a guy like Mr. C. Hope you never run into someone like him. You know, in fact, I'll put him, I'll put him uh, here. Yeah, I'll put him there. Next is Mayor Dwayne Milford. I don't think he's quite as fun as Dougie, although he does have some good gags that I enjoy. I feel like I'm going to put him in B. He's probably here for me. At the moment, at least. He is just funny. I think his interactions with Alana are some of the silliest comedy in Twin Peaks. It's very stupid. But if I just embrace the stupidity of it, I can have a good time. So I'm, I'm going to say that I, I enjoy him enough to, to warrant the B rating. I think at this point, I need to move Audrey up to A. 
And I'm going to put her actually ahead of Chad. Oh, do I put her ahead of Dougie? I don't think I do. I think I leave her where she is. And then I'm also going to put Catherine in A, and I'm going to put her above Chad. So th this feels like we're getting a little bit more accurate to how I feel just by moving those two up. Um, that, that feels right to do that. Next is the Warden Murphy, uh, manufactured for a purpose. I think he's got a fun um, performance aspect. I think it's the same voice who does the archivist in Secret History. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm, I think that's right, though. So, it's again, fun performance. I, I like the uh, the angles there. Um, just not really as much really going on in the story or, or narrative to, to justify more than that, I would say. Big Ed Hurley. I do like Big Ed, um, but not maybe as much as a lot of other people do. I'm going to put him here. I think that uh, there's some there's some fun moments where he's interacting with Norma and obviously the compassion there. Some of the moments with Nadine are quite moving, I think. And there's some good parts where he's working with the Bookhouse Boys, wearing that fantastic stash at the casino. And, of course, the highlight for Big Ed for me is the access guide, which at one point measures the height of the Snoqualmie Falls in Big Ed's and talks about how he ate... I want to say like, it was like a stupid number. It was like 20 pancakes in like 15 minutes or something like enough pancakes. That this man should have been killed by those pancakes. So I, I'm going to put him in B because I think there's some fun things around him. I, I do enjoy aspects of his character. Uh, the I'm so sorry delivery in the pilots. One of my favorite, like I'd almost say bad deliveries, but it's just so stilted. It's again, comedic gold to me. I, I, I like him. I also just noticed with the finger, I'm like going around his hairline. So I better stop doing that. Uh, next is Eileen Hayward, who, oh man, I, I guess I'm going to say is manufactured for a purpose like Betty and, and put her right b beside Betty as well. The, the main part where you get spotlight with her is with the Benjamin Horn uh, fatherhood idea. And I think there's a little bit of depth there, getting a little bit of an insight on the fact that those three used to be friends and then there was that affair that happened. But I don't know if it gives enough to really give Eileen a sense of identity or character outside of um, just being a member of the Hayward family. Emery Battis, obviously straight to S tier. Number one, no. Um, I think Emery Battis is kind of appropriately dis, dis, dislikable. Uh, what ultimately wins me over to Emery Battis, though, is the access guide giving a little bit more of a, a layout to his character that he would, I think, dress up as something for the parade at Halloween. I, I remember being kind of funny, like he like a, a wizard or something like that. It was, it was over the top. I think his, his weird, like... His weird like fetish scene in the in the uh, One Eyed Jacks was really fun. I, I I like him, but obviously he's not a good person. He's just interesting as being kind of a bad guy, not to the extent of Chad, but also a different kind of guy than Chad. Ernie Niles, I like a bit more. Uh, very sympathetic mess of a character. I like him more than Hutch and Chantal. I like him more than Candy. I like him more than Becky. Ooh, mayor. I like him more than the mayor. I like him more than Carl Rod. Do I like him more than Andy? I think I like him more than Andy. I don't like him more than the than uh, the the Mitchums. Which I should go and find the other Mitchum brother right over here because I I don't think that they're going to be apart from each other. I'll, I'll give the slight edge to Jim Belushi, but they're neck and neck. I, I think that the reason I put Ernie Niles this high, which is higher than a lot of people probably would, is that I think his role is kind of unique. There's a lot of bad guys in Twin Peaks. There's a lot of scheming businessmen, crooks, and all sorts of criminals. And Ernie Niles finds himself as this sort of gullible, go-to guy as a pawn that clearly has no idea what he's doing, is borderline useless, and his wife Vivian is just this menace to him, but also he is trying to con her at the same time. So he becomes this like 
almost Sisyphean character where you just you just know he's not going to work out at the end of the day. So I, I, I kind of agree with Tammy in finding a bit of sympathy for poor Ernie Niles. While at the same time acknowledging he's not a good person. He's not a good guy. He's just kind of a mess. He, he is funny. I think that his back and forth with Hank and John Renault is, is very engaging for what it is. So I, I am going to put him there. I think for Evelyn Marsh, I, I have to say, I don't quite like the character and, you know, I want to be clear again that I don't think that I hate this character. I, I don't think that at all. And I don't, really mind it as much as a lot of people in terms of the Evelyn Marsh storyline. But I also think it's probably one of the least original and least interesting angles because there's other material that's explored similar concepts a bit better than this particular storyline in Twin Peaks. And outside of being this sort of, you know, tragic character, this sort of scheming woman who is trying to get out of an abusive situation but also is being manipulated by this other guy and kind of caught in the middle aside from all that there really isn't much to her and we see better versions of even that kind of character in Twin Peaks um, especially Josie I think is a better version of this character so I'm going to put her next to James the experiment is strange because that isn't really a character <laughs> um, I mean like I'm just putting it here for right now. I might move it, but Bob has this consistency of presence that even if it's hard to pin down exactly what or who Bob is, and and there is a sense of like character to Bob that I just don't get out of the experiment. I'm going to assume it's the same thing as the... Fr well, it's not the same thing as the Frog Moth, but obviously connected to it. It's, it's probably Jow Day. It's probably connected to Tammy's ideas on these evil spirits with Beelzebub and all that. And it's probably also a metaphor for closure or something, but as like an actual character, it's just a terrifying silent hill monster. I like the terrifying silent hill monster, I, I guess, but how do I, how do I rank that? <laughs> how do I rank the, like when I'm looking over here, it's like, do I like the terrifying silent hill monster more than candy? Um, I, I guess, I don't know. Like, what am I even ranking with this thing? Um, I guess I'll put it there, but don't scrutinize this choice. This one is really hard to figure out because it doesn't have any dialogue. It doesn't have any personality. It is just a really effective horror creature. And it only really shows up like twice I guess depends on how you read into things maybe Sarah Palmer has an aspect of it in her who knows but I, I it's effective so I'm gonna put it there uh, the fireman I I think is a bit better um, probably put him there so we first meet him as the giant in the original series of season two's premiere great premiere episode and the giant having this sort of enigmatic presence in Dale Cooper's life that's really fun that's really good the it's happening again the waving arms of no very ominous sort of imagery with Maddie's death and then in the return, um, we get the a fireman who may be the same character, maybe an evolution. Who's to say? It might also be the spirit of Margaret Lannerman's dead husband inside the log. Who is again to say? But a very interesting character nonetheless, a great presence uh, for sort of the supernatural elements. I, I think that he is very good at, at being that sort of enigma. Probably another controversial hot take, but also maybe one that isn't surprising giving my leanings on the return. I don't really care much for the new Sheriff Truman, the Frank Truman character. I like him less than James. I probably like him less than Evelyn. And I, I don't know, do I like him less than Charlie? I guess I like him less than Charlie. I just have nothing to say or feel about this character. I think that Robert Forster does fine. But I think any sort of chemistry or charisma from there's no Harry Truman is just not there. I don't think that his relationship with Hawk is that particularly interesting or with Bobby or Andy or any other member of the force. He just kind of glides into scenes and exists and mostly just sits there and nods his head. Um, and his stuff with his wife, I didn't really care for that much when it was in the return. So I just am left 
thinking probably his finest moment is when he just non-reacts to Wally Brando uh, and the road meets your wheels sort of thing. I, I, I think that that was kind of funny, but that has more to do with Wally Brando for me than with Frank Truman's. I'm going to, I'm going to put Frank Truman as a chowder headed yokel. Again, all respect to Robert Forster. Also, Freddy, I do not like, but I will give him the credit for being kind of funny. So I guess I'll put him right next to his buddy, James. I, I just, it's hard to separate Freddy from just the ending with Bob. But even before that, what does he have? Like he has a exposition scene with James where he goes through this backstory where it's tell don't show. And we just kind of get told about this thing that supposedly happened with the fireman. And then he like knocks someone out at a bar And then he knocks out Chad and then he fights the blob Bob. And I just, I think Freddy's kind of funny as a concept. He has a Hulk glove and punches things, but narratively, I do not know why he defeated Bob. I'm sure there may have been some interesting intentions behind it, but I find Freddy to be kind of unremarkable. Um, It's an unremarkable side character who became way too important in a critical way, especially if we consider Bob being this metaphor for a great evil. He just got beat up (laughs) by a green glove guy. I, I, I don't think it's too surprising that um, that I'm putting him this low, even if I could see other people giving him more benefit of the doubt and putting him in a B. I just don't think a lot of people love Freddy. I could be wrong. I just don't think Freddy, like, when I look at my D tier, you might not personally rank any of these as low as I am. That's fine. But I'd be curious if any of you love these people because I just think that they're generally not universally loved characters in the Twin Peaks canon. Unlike Major Briggs, who's going right there in S tier. Ooh, is he better than Mr. C or not, though? That's tough. I know I like Ben Horn a bit more. But I think I'm going to put Major Briggs above Mr. C. It's very close. I think that Major Briggs' scene with Bobby in the diner is one of the all-time best scenes in Twin Peaks. Without, like, going through them all, it's probably a top 10 scene in Twin Peaks. And the acting on the part of uh, Mr. Don Davis was superb. He's got such a presence to his voice, to his mannerisms. Uh, As a character, he's just really interesting. He's this disciple of Dougie Milford, of all people, who is taking on this enormous task of investigating the supernatural and the unknown in the town of Twin Peaks and at large, wrestling at the same time with his own doubts about the U.S. government, feeling like maybe the government would not be best trusted to have these secrets and power. And then because he's at work all the time, he's becoming estranged from his son who he's trying desperately to leave an impact with and try to set on the right path while probably a large part of him knowing that Bobby is falling away to what extent he knows about the drugs or Laura. It's hard to say, but he's just got a really important presence. His chemistry with Dale Cooper when they're doing their fishing stuff is great. Not fishing, camping, whatever you call that. That was great. I I just... I think he's like, again, so quintessential. I, I think he's so captivating as a figure and, and clearly one of the most intelligent and deeply spiritual characters of the show. His Even the stuff with Wyndham Earl, when you see the character under the influence of Haloperidol and under the influence of drugs, and I think with Haloperidol or, or something like that, and, and having to mutter about like Judy Garland and is love enough. It's always compelling. It's always good. I, I, I really enjoy him. Um, I, I think that he's a great character. Gersten Hayward. Oh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like in the original show, she's just one of the sisters of the Hayward family and she likes to play music. And that's all I really got for her. And I think I would just put her in manufactured for a purpose. But then in the return, she just reappears. And it's weird because no one ever calls her Gersten. Like the only way you would know is if you recognize the actor miraculously or you read the credits or you're part of the fan community. It's just not even really like a thing that ever is said. But she is somewhat important as this woman in Steven's life. And we get this picture of her, especially in the final dossier of kind of what happened. But a lot of it is just being told to us rather than actually getting 
interesting Gersten dialogue or Gersten relationships or Gersten moments. I, I see her comforting the distraught Steven, and that's about all I really got. So I think I'm going to say she's manufactured for a purpose. Um, I suppose I like her a bit less than Bushnell Mullins. Probably put her, eh, probably put Constance, if that's her name, put her put her above. Uh, and, and probably, yeah, leave her right there. Uh, I just, I think that there's some interesting ideas on the table, but they're just kind of left on the table, which maybe is fine. Um, this is David Lynch, the director. Clearly, he doesn't belong in the list. Um, but if I'm going to call him Gordon Cole, oh, I'm going to put him in a divided heart for me. I'm going to put him probably there. This is one that I maybe need to do a bit of explaining. <laughs> for those who haven't heard the podcast, my co-host is very much against Gordon Cole. I am more mixed I think that the kiss with Shelly is a bit unusual. I don't know narratively why it's there other than just to wake Bobby up, but I still don't think that it makes a lot of sense for the FBI director to do it. And we've got the stuff in the return where a lot of times it's David Lynch as the director being put in a very lead role that um, maybe other characters could have enjoyed more of that spotlight instead. There are some scenes involving Gordon Cole that I just think take way too long and aren't that interesting. Like that random like French woman leaving his apartment. Oh my God. And I just, I don't really love or hate the character. I think he's very fine. Um, I think if it wasn't the director like playing the character. I think that if it was just some random actor, I don't think there'd be nearly as much adoration for Gordon Cole in the fan community as there is. Um, because I think it's the fact that it's literally David Lynch is what makes it for people. And it is funny, like having the director of the, you know, Twin Peaks uh, pilot and director of Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me and director of a lot of Twin Peaks being the literal director of the FBI and having that relationship with Cooper, that is that is fun. I do like it, and I think in small doses, like in Fire Walk With Me, it, it works. I just think that maybe he got a bit overplayed in the return and kind of leaves me mixed, like I said. Hank, however, I do quite like. I'm actually going to put Hank in the damn good category. I'm going to put him for myself actually at the front of damn good and i know i'm probably rating him higher than most people would i do think there was some missed potential because once season two kind of got going he ends up getting beat up by several people including nadine out for the count basically and leaves the show but up until that point his blood oath stuff with Josie, incredible scene. His back and forths with Ben are so interesting. His weird angle where you never quite know what he's doing. He's like somewhere between the muscle, like a henchman, but also a schemer and a planner as well. I think he really is an interesting little niche then by Twin Peaks uh, antagonist standards. And I think that even the stuff with Ernie Niles and Jean Renault is quite good. I think that Hank really could have paid off in interesting ways, either through the bookhouse angle with Harry Truman, or um, if they would have had like more of an idea for him long-term with his own sort of plans or machinations. But I think that outside of kind of a little bit of a disappointing conclusion to the character, I think he's just a really interesting performance to watch. And I can't deny that some of those scenes with Hank are some of my favorite in Twin Peaks. I also really like Harold. I'm going to put Harold for me in the A tier. I'm going to put him probably above Dougie. Probably there. Because even like putting Hank above Bob, I know is like wild. But uh, but I, I, think I, I think I put Harold around here. He doesn't have a lot of time in the show, but I think he's really a strong presence. Like if you look at screen time amount to impact they leave, Harold might be one of the most potent characters. If he would have been there for a bunch of more episodes, I don't know if that would have even been better because I think he left so much of an impact in the time he was there. I think his back and forth with Donna was really good as, as a relationship. The little bit we get in Fire Walk With Me is haunting because we see Laura turn into the sort of Bob figure at him and the diary suggests the idea that she had basically been assaulting Harold that 
Harold was the number one victim of Laura Palmer in a lot of ways. That's, I think, really um, kind of alarming to find out. Harold is just such a tragic character, but also so sweet and like clearly wronged and hurt by people like Laura and like Donna after. And uh, my heart goes out to the guy. You know, I, I feel really bad. I think he's got an amazing theme. I love Harold's theme. I think it's one of the more underrated tracks by Angelo Badalamenti in the score. And um, I think that like a lot of these high ranking ones, the performance is really good. Any sort of comments I would see from the actor were always very much like putting himself in the shoes of this character and really trying to empathize with the role. And I think it comes through in the final product. I, I think it genuinely does. Like I remember hearing something about how they were going to actually have him lash out at Donna and the actor kind of sticking up and saying, Hey, no, Harold wouldn't hurt anyone. And so they directed the violence at himself rather than toward them. Instead, there was just something special and kind of magical going on with Harold that, um, Really, of all the characters who were only having a limited amount of screen time, he's definitely one of the best, in my opinion. Harriet, um, Harriet's good. Uh, she's my favorite manufactured with a purpose. Uh, she is, you know, got like one part in the <laughs> in the pilot. I think she might show up later, maybe with Gersten at the Hayward family dinner. I don't remember. And then she gets referenced in the final dossier. Um Blossom of the evening, you know, I, I think she's fun, but also like, I got nothing really to say. I've heard some people have strong opinions on her. I think it's notable that she is like the healthiest Hayward somehow like coming out of all this and just seeming to do okay. Um, so good for her. I, I respect that. And I appreciate that. Harry S. Truman. Who oh boy. He's going way to the top. I, I got to put Harry in S tier. I got to put him probably there. But again, anyone in S tier, it's it's super high caliber. I think, you know, in the past, I might not have put him in S tier if I did this like, you know, two years ago or so. But as I kind of think back on it, Harry is one of those more quiet, um, consistent elements of the show that aren't as loud and crazy and wild as some of the more out there characters. But that's kind of what makes him work. Like he's such a great foil to true to Truman, that's himself. He's such a great foil to Dale Cooper, is what I meant to say, that it just really works. And his dynamic with the Bookhouse Boys, with the other police officers, is great. I think that his stuff with Josie, at first, is a bit confusing, like, why is this happening? But when we actually deal with the aftermath of Josie's death, and you see Truman turn to drinking, and kind of his, his other tendencies, his history with Hank kind of in the background as well. There's more complications in the works for his character. And even when we get in the final dossier, that implies that he never gave up looking for Dale Cooper. I um, I really like Harry Truman. I've heard some people read Harry Truman not giving up on Dale Cooper as like a bad thing, like he couldn't let go or something. I take it to be loyalty. You know, I take it to be loyalty to his friend. Uh, I think it's weird that the final dossier does not show any of the research that he had. Because like if he spent the last 25 years looking for his friend, why is there nothing that Tammy found of note in that research? Did, did Harry literally find nothing in 25 years? Not even a single thing? I think that's kind of wild. And I, I more put it as like a maybe a missed opportunity for the book rather than against Harry himself. But no, Harry's great. I think that he has such a like, kind of quiet form of comedic relief at times, like stuffing giant donuts in his mouth sort of deal. And really strong performance from Michael on key and all around. I, I think that it's it's quite sad not to see him in the return for whatever reason might that be. Um, but I think that uh, he was fantastic in his little series. So easily a highlight for me. Hawk also is pretty good. I'm, I guess I'm not as huge on Hawk as Harry Truman, but I still really do quite like Hawk. Um, I would probably put Hawk probably right over here above Albert and below Jacoby. I could see him swapping places with Jacoby or Annie in the future, you know, as kind of time goes on. I like what was done with Hawk in the books, actually. I thought that they did a pretty, like Mark Frost did a pretty good job with him establishing more of his personality in his writing, as well as his relationship with Margaret um, being emphasized further. I quite like that. I think he should have been sheriff in the return. I think that instead of handing it to Frank, we should have seen Hawk be the sheriff. 
I think he was more than qualified to do it. He already, in the original series, was like the law officer doing the most amount of work, it feels like. The dude was everywhere all the time and was just great. Uh, expert marksman, expert friend, just an all-around good guy. Um, I think that he is, you know, not always the most out there character, kind of like with Harry, but he's a nice, like, stable, good person that it's nice to have around out the cast. Working our way toward kind of the last ones here. There's obviously a few big ones as well as a few minor ones. I'm going to put, I forget her name, but the the giggling, oh, Heidi, Heidi, the uh, the giggling uh, or double R worker. She's definitely manufactured for a purpose. I, I think, um, I don't know. I'll put her there, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> She's just kind of there for two moments and then in the return again. And she's got kind of a, a one joke. And uh, it's it's not a bad joke. The Ike the Spike, I'll also say, was manufactured for a purpose. Although he's pretty good. Um, I guess I'll put him here. Well... I probably like him actually a bit more. He, he's he got a really memorable scene where he goes and kills Lorraine and other people in the area. But uh, I, I think that was fun with the music and the performance aspect of it. So I'll, I'll put him in kind of at the higher end of manufactured for a purpose. I'm also just kind of what we're at it. Let's get rid of a lot more of the, the manufactured for a purpose characters. Let's just get those out of the way. So like Jade, I think it also be in that area. I, I wish we could have gotten more from her to really flesh out her character. But again, uh, with how many characters in the return, I think at a certain point we were never going to get a lot of depth out of everyone. It's just that when you look at the cast of Twin Peaks, there are very few people who are non-white actors. We got, obviously, Hawk. Um, even the fact that his character is named Hawk, I think, has some implications that some parts of Twin Peaks material address that his name is Tommy Hill, but everyone calls him Hawk. Uh, Josie, you got Josie, um, and that's mostly it. There's not a lot of major key players who are of color or are non-white. So I, I think there was some missed potential for diversity in the cast, especially in the return. And I won't harp on this too much. I, I just, I think that there was, again, a missed potential there. Anyway, what was I doing? I was looking at the minor characters over here. Anyone else who's manufactured? Um, Jonathan, I think, was his name. Um, he is just a guy. I'll put him, I don't know, probably last. I didn't quite care for him. Um, other ones on here, we got the person at the police department who talks to Chad about what's going on and seems kind of to kind of give Chad a bit of her business. I'll put her probably, you know, there, I guess. Uh, there's the slot lady addict, I believe is what she's called in the credits, who unconditionally loves Dougie because of the condition that he made her rich. I think that she is fine. I think I'll put this person who gets attacked, uh, who is a teacher of some kind, I guess, here, because I just feel less than anything about her character. Um, there's this guy who, oh, actually another non-white character. Um, this is someone who's involved with the military who, uh, suspends activities involving Dale Cooper. Um, mildly remember, memorable kind of role, but, um, not that much. I'll put her neck, put him next to this, uh, military woman here. Um, we got the roadhouse announcer who really puts his all into it. I got to give him credit for that. So, I guess I'll put him, I don't know, put her, put him above Gerstin, I suppose. Other characters on here. Um, I guess it's Nido. Nido's manufactured for a purpose. Uh, I think that she's less interesting to me than Carrie Page. There is the intern at the Lucky Seven. He's kind of uh, got a couple moments that are fun with Dougie. That's about really it. I'll probably yeah I'd probably put him here yeah probably below Jade I guess we've got Red who <laughs> I think could have been more but also he is just a one time character so well like two or three times with a uh, with Shelly, but not really much else with him, so I'll put him 
also kind of in this sort of general area. I, I don't really quite care for his character all that much, so I'll just put him there. We also have, who else is here? Little Nicky, I don't know. Little Nicky, is he manufactured for, yeah, he's definitely manufactured for a purpose. I, I, um, I like the idea of some of the conflict that happens with Little Nicky. So I'm going to put him ahead of Nido, which I don't know if that's fair or not. There's Sam, who was fine. I kind of like his awkward um, back and forth with Tracy. Who I'm going to, I don't know which one I like better. I guess I'll, I'll give it to Tracy because behind the scenes, the actor for her was blowing bubbles. I think that's kind of funny. So I'm going to put her above Sam by, by one ranking here. We also have the guy who likes tea now. I suppose I like him a little better than the intern and a little better than Jade. That the last of the completely manufactured characters. I mean, Sunny Jim, I think, is debatably manufactured for a purpose. In the great battle of children in Twin Peaks, I guess I like little Nikki more than, <laughs> than, than the beacon of goodness that is uh, Sunny Jim. I also saw while I was looking here, Renzo's quite good for being a, a one-off kind of... Um, imposing figure. He's getting a lot of credit just for being part of the, that Mr. C scene of returning to starting positions. The guy who is trying to buy out stuff with the double R and franchise it, do not even like black forest or something. <laughs> I don't remember his name, Walter William, something in there. I'm, I'm going to put him honestly, Probably the lowest on here. I, I I don't really think he added much as a character. And I think that's everything. I think everyone else that's left probably warrants a bit more of a conversation. Maybe Jones doesn't. I'll put Jones. I don't know. Pretty low. I didn't really care for Jones as a concept. Yeah, I'll put her by Jonathan there. Yeah, that should be every one, I think. And if I missed one, I'll, I'll find him when I go through. All right, so at the first of the Renaults, which I'm just I'm realizing we skipped Bern Bernard. Um, oh, no, everyone's favorite Renault brother was skipped. Oh, no. Um, this list has been really thorough otherwise, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overlook that. But uh, needless to say, Bernard would be in the manufactured somewhere. Uh, whereas Jacques Renault is quite good. I quite like Jacques Renault. I, I think I'm going to put him... Ooh, I'm going to put him below Albert, probably below the Mitchum brothers. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, probably put the Mitchum brothers ahead of Albert, which I don't know, again, maybe that's a hot take, but I like the Mitchum brothers quite a lot. Um, I like Jacques Renault better than Ernie, though, so I think that's a pretty good spot for him. The deliveries on some of the lines that Jacques gets are so good. You know, the bite the bullet, the maybe Bobby, maybe, uh, just great stuff. Even in the return, the... John Jacques Renault, the new Renault who's played by the same performer. Uh, that's that's some great stuff there. Um, just a just an all around really interesting character performance. I also think that Jacques is characterized really interestingly in the diary. Um, again, not a good man. In fact, a very bad man who is taking advantage of someone. But the way in which his behavior and personality is contrasted with Leo's in the book is quite interesting. And I just overall think that, like, when we see Jock Renault on screen, he is a captivating presence. Janie E. Jones, I'm going to put her, I guess I'll put her in the, the, the liking category. I feel like I like her probably about that much. I think that Naomi Watts is a great actress. I think that... We see some pretty good performance elements from her character in The Return. Uh, probably my highlight scene with her would be when she shows up at the playground and gives a talking to with those um, those uh, two men who are trying to get money out of the family. I, I quite enjoy that delivery. I uh, I think I'll I think in the midst of all the Dougie stuff that I'm a little bit mixed on, she's usually a pretty good aspect of that storyline. 
Jean Renault I actually like a bit more than Jacques. Do I like him more than... Yeah, I like him more than Albert. Do I like him more than the Mitchum brothers? Not really. I think that that's actually a great place. Albert awkwardly in the middle of the two uh, of the two Renaults there. Jean is just such a strong presence when he's on the screen. I think in the wake of Leland's death, there wasn't much of an antagonist role yet filled. Wyndham Earl wouldn't come till later. I think that Jean Renault was actually a pretty good um, villain in the middle of those things. A pretty good antagonist. I think that the finale scene we get of him, where again he tells Dale Cooper that the Things were simpler before he came here. That was very good. I think that his interplay with other characters is very good. He's continuously strong in scenes. He's someone that manages to be more persuasive and more influential than even someone like Ben Horn. And I think that he does it well. I think that the actor carries that idea very well. Jerry Horn uh, is very fun. I think that... Uh, um, the, probably the through line I would say between the original show and the return is he's a man of indulgence. He is a man of uh, of enjoying things in life. Maybe the finer things in life, one could argue. I think Jerry's fun. I think Jerry, for me, is going to go probably here. Um, I don't think his character is ever all that especially deep, but it is very funny that he ultimately would have the most successful business venture, maybe in Horn family history, through his uh, 420 friendly enterprise, as we shall say. Uh, the fact that Ben worked so hard and did all these schemes and conniving and Jerry ends up having this big success is, is quite funny. Uh, I think that the performance is, is usually quite engaging as well. And the behind the scenes material where we see... David Patrick Kelly playing music and singing that very traditional sort of song. I think it's quite beautiful. So I, I enjoy what he brings to the character on screen and off screen. John Justice Wheeler, I think is fine. Um, would I go so far? Yeah, I mean, I like Billy Zane. I'll, I'll, I'll say that I like Billy Zane and kind of let that be my my rationale for liking him at all. I, I think he's he's honestly fine. Um, I think given how big the B category is turning out to be, I think I'm going to start lowering actually some of those in here. So if I go with the highest being John Justice Wheeler, I guess I would probably say I like him less than Donna, less than Denise. Probably put him there. Let's lower Blackie down to probably there. And then Judge Sternwood probably there. Now, I feel like that's a bit fairer to do that. So lopping those down over to C plus Johnny Horn. Oh boy. Um, Johnny Horn. I'm going to put divided on that. The native American headdress, some of the portrayals of his like mental health condition, not always the, um, maybe best aged over time. Uh, the scene in the return is quite haunting for its violence. I would definitely say, and I think that the, you know, hello, Johnny, how are you today? Like bear thing is uh, very memorable as a visual design, but I'm going to, I'm going to put him in di divided heart for myself. I think probably the most interesting material with Johnny for me was in the diary. Hearing Laura's perspective on Johnny was quite good. Josie is S tier for me. I'm going to go move her right up there. In fact, I might even put her above Mr. C. I might put her above Harry. And I guess for me, the more I dive into Josie, the more interested and invested I am. I feel like she is one of the most complex characters in all of Twin Peaks. I think that, again, supplementary material does some good work there for her. Between the diary and secret history, you get more of a sense of her life and kind of the complications. I think very few characters embody the dualities of Twin Peaks more than Josie, that she is victim as well as victimizer, that she is the predator and the prey, that she is someone who is seemingly very meek and vulnerable while also being cutthroat and dangerous. And I think that all around, she is just continuously engaging and she's so good on rewatch because when you kind of know where the end game of her character is, all these scenes with Catherine and Pete early on and even Harry start to get recontextualized a bit. And so I think she might be one of the characters that's most interesting upon rewatch. I think the first moment when Josie started to be interesting to me 
really interesting to me was when I was listening to the Shoo Shoo album of playing the music of Twin Peaks. And in that, they end with a song called Josie's Past. And I think he uses like parts from Laura's diary because there's this linkage between Laura and Josie that gets to be really interesting the more I think about it. So I just, I find myself drawn to Josie as this very tortured, very dark and dynamic character that, you know, I think invites so much more nuance and continuous investigation that makes her so compelling to me. And I mentioned earlier with Hank, but that blood oath scene is fantastic. And a lot of the scenes with Catherine are fantastic. Some of the stuff where she even maneuvers around Ben is great to see. Those power dynamics are always very engaging for me personally. Lana Butta Milford, also a bit of a dangerous woman, although I think that she is you know, less uh, <laughs> less of a deep character than Josie. It's interesting how much the books like ran with her. Mark Frost really liked to just use this character, which I thought was pretty interesting, her involvement with the Jade Ring. I, I like her maybe more than a lot of people would. I I, I guess, nah, I'll put, a, I'll put her probably there. I don't think I like her more than, uh, than Janie E, but it's pretty close. Laura Palmer, oh boy, oh boy. Um... I, I'm not going to break tradition. I am going to put Laura in S tier. I'm going to put her in S tier, but probably the lowest one. It really depends on what Laura we're talking about and, and where we're getting it from. For me, the best Laura is in The Diary and in Fire Walk With Me. Then the little bit we get to see in the original series has some moments where it's good, some moments where it's kind of awkward, depending on the, the, the scripting. And then in the return with the stuff with Carrie Page, again, Carrie Page is listed as a separate character here. So whether Laura really appears, or I guess you could talk about the one in the Red Room. Um, I don't really know what to say or feel about Laura uh, in the return, but... When you actually get into the complexities and nuances and depth of Laura Palmer, she's fantastic. And I think like Cheryl Lee does so much with this character that, you know, I know I can't put her below Mr. C. I do have to put her ahead of Josie even because I feel like those characters are linked in my mind. And I'll come out to bat for Josie being maybe, um, a bit underrated by people, but I, I, I think Laura is, it needs to be firmly at the top. Uh, this puts her in like top five, I guess for me. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's going to beat that. We'll see. But yeah, I, I feel like it doesn't need to, need to be explained very much. She's one of the deepest characters. She's one of the most nuanced. I think the performance is incredible. Fire Walk With Me is an all-timer. Probably Cheryl Lee gave one of the best performances in any David Lynch film, and that's saying quite a lot because there's great performances, even alongside like Ray Wise. Like She was keeping up and doing a fantastic job. And I think that, again, she's just the center of the story. You can't have Twin Peaks without Dale Cooper or Laura Palmer. They're, they're very, very good characters. Leland also going straight to S tier. I think I'm going to put Leland probably between Laura and Josie. Um, it's hard to separate him completely from Bob. I think that the element of how much is Leland, how much is Bob is always going to be this really fascinating discussion item for Twin Peaks fans. I think he's this very tortured character and, and as an antagonist, one of the most terrifying. We don't have much of it, but when Leland is revealed to be the killer and we know, but Dale Cooper doesn't, those moments where Ray Wise turns away from everyone else and does that menacing grin. I mean, it's top tier character acting. I think that in Fire Walk With Me, it's fantastic. I do wish that the uh, Where's My Axe, I'm Hungry scene might have been uh, incorporated into Fire Walk With Me. I would, I wish that one would have been in the movie um, just because it's so much fun and it shows the the potentially lighter moments of the Palmer family amidst all of this. I, I, I think that he's great. I think he's fantastic. Um, and I think without really again, needing to explain much, Leland is definitely an all-timer in Twin Peaks. Leo Johnson, I am... Hmm, how do I feel about Leo Johnson? I... Huh. It's weird, because, like, in the pilot and early Twin Peaks, I think Leo's one of the more stilted performances, and as a character, he's just so obviously suspicious as this abusive husband character that, you know... You, most people, I think, are going to look at it and say, well, he can't be the killer. It's too obvious. But then he's, like, genuinely menacing. When he has, like, the soap 
and he's like spinning it around. And like when he's threatening Bobby and Shelly, he's actually genuinely menacing. And then turning that character into this sort of comic element with Bobby is interesting. He then gets something you could argue is a redemption arc with Wyndham Earl. He just has such a unique and weird role in the story that I, I guess I like him. Uh, I suppose I like him a fair amount. Do I like him more than Andy? I mean, I like him more than Ernie, so I guess I do. Um... Yeah? I guess I'm just gonna probably keep him there. I, I think, like, he's just such an interesting weird mix of emotions like that part in fire walk with me when it's like this is where we live Shelly and he's like going off about cleaning the floor or whatever it's maybe unintentionally maybe intentionally hilarious I the the where he was in like the horse costume with Wyndham Earl I yeah I, I, he's such a memorable character I have to put him there also not breaking tradition I'm gonna put Margaret Lanterman in S tier um, I'm going to put her probably right there at the lower end of S tier. In the original show, she's really not there actually that much. She's most notable, I would say, for being in the introductions of the episodes, the openings. And those weren't added until later. But she becomes kind of this mouthpiece for David Lynch's ideas. And I think she's really good at that. I think that she's very memorable for doing that. I think that the return is beyond what anyone would ever expect of a performance it's not really acting at that point. Um, I think it's one of those things where amidst all of the actors who unfortunately passed away before the return could happen, you know, like Don Davis for major Briggs or Pete Martell's performer, Jack Nance. Um, I think it's very important and very vital that Catherine Coulson was able to give that performance for Margaret Lanterman. And, Again, it strains even acting. She's literally a woman dying. The stuff with Margaret Lanterman was some of the first stuff shot for the return from what I was reading. And it's it's heartbreaking. And it's so powerful. And it feels like the return and the final dossier pay such tribute and acknowledgement to the character that I, I can't help but be swept up in the importance of what she is to Twin Peaks. And as a character, she's pretty interesting. She's one of the wisest figures in the town, but also unable to really do much of anything actively. She comes to the town now and then, mostly as this background figure, turning the lights off and on at meetings, putting pitch on the double R walls, and generally being misunderstood and confused. People don't take her very seriously, but also accept her as this anomaly. And the backstory you get for her in Secret History paints her as this really promising, very intelligent, capable woman who a lot of people just came to misunderstand over time. I think it was Dr. Jacoby's brother maybe was one of the closest ones to fully comprehend what Margaret was about, and then Hawk maybe later in life as well. But she had this sort of quiet strength to her. Even though she lived in fear in the, in the woods, facing that darkness and after the loss of her husband, mostly alone, she seemed to have this resolve that was passed on to other characters. Anyone who was willing to listen to her could gain some wisdom. And I think that the image of the log and the image of this character, that eccentricity of it in the pilot, but it's like one of those things, like when it happens in the pilot, it's like a one-off joke, but then it grows into something so much more than just a little gag. And this is crazy because like, that was something that Catherine Coulson and David Lynch had talked about like in the late seventies, I think it was that David Lynch had that idea for having Catherine Coulson talk to a log about stuff on his show or a movie. And that idea must have continued like it festered and grew into something far bigger so yeah Catherine Coulson definitely S tier for me Lucy I like Lucy I like Lucy maybe a bit more than Andy but I think they need to go together um, maybe I'll put her above Ernie you know maybe I'm being too generous to Ernie I'll, I'll knock Ernie down <laughs> I'll put those two a little bit higher Maddie, I, I think I have to say she was manufactured for a purpose. Um, I think that she's interesting as this uncanny doppelganger element to Laura. She definitely has her own personality, but it's, it's a much more subdued personality. And I think that 
her main area of interest is how she affects Donna and James more than having her own defined character arc. This guy, um, I forget his name. Where, where did I put, where did I put Evelyn? I'm going to put this, this, this guy next to Evelyn. If I can find where I put her. Oh, down over here. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put him as, as right over there. Um, right next to Evelyn, he is Malcolm Sloan. Yeah, what a name, Malcolm Sloan. Just this bad man who has to be worse than the abusive husband and worse than even Evelyn with the killing and having him be this truer evil here. But ultimately, it's just kind of a throwaway plot. I, I don't have uh, a lot really to dig into with Malcolm and... I think that justifiably he's a chowder-headed yokel. Mike Nelson, I'm pretty mixed. I'm going to say divided heart again. I'm going to say probably a little bit higher than Blackie. Because I think that the fact that he's named Snake and has that relationship with, with Bobby is probably pretty funny. But outside of like early stuff with Bobby, he ends up getting like... He ends up getting attached to Nadine and that whole storyline happens and that's pretty <laughs> debatable and problematic, one could very much argue. And then in the return, he has that part with Steven where I don't really know what to feel about it because like, was Mike justified in giving Steven that lecture or was he being really a jerk rather than actually helpful to this kid? You know, was he was he projecting because of his own youth? Does he even understand the irony of what he's saying? Like he was also, you know, literally involved in drugs and was, a, you know, not a great kid himself. Does he see himself in Steven? Who is to say? I, I think he's fine. I think he's a fine character. I uh, I don't um, I don't love Mike Nelson, but I don't hate Mike Nelson. I think that the one armed man slash Mike slash Philip Gerard is pretty good. I do, I think, like him a bit more than the Fireman and Giant. I suppose I like him more than... Probably, probably, yeah, probably more than Lucy and Andy. Um, of course, he's got the very memorable magician longs to cry out, chant, etc., etc., and uh, got some fun moments in the return with the don't die. Uh, so, so there's some good stuff definitely there. I think his character's kind of confusing as far as where Philip Gerard ends and Mike begins and where, how that even fits into the man, the one arm man. What does it mean with being Bob's familiar? There's a lot of like lore implications that I'm not a hundred percent sold on, but I think Al Strobel's performance always made it really engaging and captivating to watch. I, I, I do like the character. I think for me, my standout moment for this performance and character is probably in Fire Walk with me, where it's the 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 truck that he's driving so fast and he's yelling about the corn and how the noise is escalating. That's a really, really good part in Fire Walk with me. The Chalfont Tremond woman here, I think is pretty good. I think that I'm going to put her uh, probably, uh, yeah, probably ahead of Carl Rod even. She's so mysterious and so interesting when she's on screen that I'll, I'll give her that. Even if, again, she's not as much of a developed character, the idea and image of her is really quite good. I'll also put the grandson just one notch higher for being David Lynch's son in the original series, clearly being some weird meta stand-in potentially for Lynch himself. And the fact that he teleported cream corn is pretty nifty. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them there. Um, I'm not going to let them fell a victim. They're, they're going to be good. They're going to be at the B tier. Nadine. I like Nadine. Um, I am conflicted about things, but I do like her enough that I would put her here. You know, and in fact, I'd put her pretty high up. I would say I like Nadine more than Annie. So that's the question then. Do I like Nadine more than Chad? I probably do. More than Catherine? I probably do. And I think that's where the buck stops. I think that Nadine with the high school, you know, cheerleader arc, um, understandably it is, it is making comedic relief out of a very serious situation. And I can see some objections and eye rolls to the type of comedy that it has. But I think Nadine's dynamic with 
Ed is quite interesting. I think that her struggles and mental anguishes in season one are very sympathetic and very heartbreaking in a way. Um, I think that her personality being the sort of quiet mouse character who flips on a dime. And, and again, there's a dichotomy, there's a dualism there that's quite interesting. A duality, I should say. And when she does revert to the sort of high school phase, it kind of makes sense, even if it's a little weird. Like, she was always living for this future before that when she got the cotton balls to work through the machine and if she got it to have silent drapes, she imagined this beautiful future that she could have with Ed. This beautiful future where she could basically make it up to him, make him love her, and it'll be all perfect. So she's always living in the future. And then when she saw no future, when she kind of like lost that hope and she had that sort of, um, you know, attempt on her own life, then when she came back, she started living for the past, trying to escape to this sort of ideal version of, the, of what high school could have been, trying to live out this perfect dream. And it all builds and culminates to the end of season two, where she almost had a happy ending with Mike, but then because she got conked on the head through just some dramatic terrible twist of irony or, or I guess fate you could say she realizes what happened and in realizing who she was and what she was ruins that future and is back to square one with Ed and then in the return we see her again still with Ed now I will say I don't like necessarily how the return handled Nadine I wish that she would have had more of a role in the story I guess than just freeing uh, Ed so to speak and I think the implication that she might be dating Dr. Jacoby in the final dossier is not comfortable to me. I, I do wish Nadine had had something better for her in the return. But when she's actually in the original series, I do quite like her and think that she's a fun character. While also being a heartbreaking character, I'm going to put Norma probably next to Ed for myself. And I think... Yeah, that's probably where I'd put her. I think that the performance is good. I like her relationships with Shelly, especially with Annie, with Ed, with Hank. Actually, you know what? I'll probably put her ahead of Ed for that reason. Probably ahead of Hutch and Chantal. Yeah, I'll probably put her there. And I feel that... She's, again, one of those stable people in the town that are good to have as a contrast to some of the wackier characters. And I quite enjoy what she does as that sort of quiet motherly character for the likes of Shelley and how she is such a strong foundation, even if maybe in sometimes she tries to help everyone but herself, which makes it so she isn't able to have that happy ever after with Ed until much, much later. But I think she's still a good character to have around. Pete Martell, I really enjoy. He's always fun. I'm going to put Pete, I suppose, probably above Hawk for me personally. Maybe below Jacoby. And I think at this point I'm going to move Annie and Jacoby and Pete all to A tier for myself. Move them over there. Philip Jeffries... He is an enigma. Um, he, do I, do I consider him manufactured for a purpose? If it was just fire walk with me and nothing else, it'd be really a clear case maybe for that. But then he does come back in the return under these sort of mysterious circumstances, unclear of what or who he is. I think that draw of the mystery is enough that I'm going to put him probably, uh, you know, above the Tremons. Probably above the experiment, above the giant and firemen. Probably above the sad clown of Ernie Niles. And I like David Bowie, so I'm going to put him, yeah. Put him maybe above Jerry. I think I have to stop there because I, I find Jacques Renault to be a more defined entity. And um, I think I'll probably put him there. But yeah, Philip Jeffries is really interesting. I, I don't really know if when uh, Robert Engels and David Lynch wrote Fire Walk With Me, if they knew what exactly was going to be going on with Philip Jeffries. Even when you look at the missing pieces added on, it's still unclear what exactly Judy was or is. 
Um, I, there's some things with Josie's potential sister or relative or whatever. And then obviously the books have their own explanation and the return has its own exploration, maybe not an explanation, but I think the teasing and oddity of the moment itself is pretty standout. And he does say the we live inside a dream line, which I, I think like that's so important to the return and its ethos that even if, you know, Philip Jeffrey's time was really short, he obviously left this huge impact on the, on the series, on the franchise and on David Lynch's psyche. It feels like Ray is definitely better than Daria. He, he obviously has more going on for his character. I, I feel like, I'm divided only because I think he could have been more than maybe what he was. So I'm going to put him probably there. I think his dynamic with Mr. C can be interesting. I think that his uh, role with the Renzo back to starting position scene is good. I, I like Ray as a character. I like his, his aesthetic, his visuals there. He, he's an interesting, uh, interesting guy. So I'll, I'll put him in. I'll put him in there. I'm only divided because I think maybe he could have been more developed. I guess I'll say. Richard Horn. Okay, so Richard Horn. I can't say I like him because he's obviously an awful person, but he's so thoroughly rotten, and the performance brings so much to that that I think he's a better version of Leo. I think him running over that child was a bit overkill, and I don't necessarily like the way that that scene was fully shot, but he has so many other moments, like that scene with his, uh, with his grandmother, with Sylvia. God dang, that's so awful like it's it's so well done but it, it makes him into this sort of wretched character one of the first impressions we also get of him is at the roadhouse with that that woman that he attacks it's it's really disgusting but like the characterization is so strong i think the actor does such a great job with it i, I yeah i'm gonna put him as a better version of leo johnson leo johnson wins out for the comedy act but i think in terms of the raw menace i think richard horn is gonna take the cake there uh speaking of richard dick Tremaine himself, I need to move very high. He's, is he A? Is he S? Probably, oh boy. Oh boy. This is tough. Because it's like, ask me most days of the week, who do I like better? Richard Horn or the log lady, Margaret Lannerman? I like Richard Horn quite a lot. I think he's very funny. I really enjoy what's going on with that character and the, the sense of humor with it. At the same time, he does not really matter. And I wouldn't say he's an especially deep character. So I'm genuinely torn. I think I just have to follow my gut though and say that I endorse this man as an S tier. He is the gum that I like. No big discussion necessary here. I could see you you know, rolling your eyes at this character and finding him annoying. But I, I think he's continuously great. I think that the performance is a lot of fun. The little Nikki stuff is silly. The Andy Lucy triangle is silly. But doggone it, he's so fun to watch that I'm going to go ahead and put him in S. Ronna Pulaski, I wish had been more than manufactured for a purpose, but I'll put her as my favorite manufactured for a purpose. And I'm assuming this also includes... American Girl from The Return. Uh, next, we have the counterpoint to Chet Desmond, which is Sam Stanley. I do like Sam Stanley more than Chet, although probably not much more to put, her, put him above like Lana or Janie E. I think that his meticulous, very nervous habits are pretty interesting to watch. I think that he foils really nicely off of Chet Desmond. And um, yeah, nothing, nothing but good to say about Kiefer Sutherland's character. It's just kind of a nice, nice little performance in Firewalk with me. I don't think needed to be anything much more than what it was. Maybe in the return, if they, I don't know if Kiefer Sutherland was contacted or was available. Maybe you could have saw what happened to him years later, what's left of him or where, where he's kind of at with the FBI. But I don't think there needed to be that story. I think he was, was good with what he was. 
Sarah Palmer, I'm going to be putting in the probably A tier. I'm probably going to put her... Hmm, probably put her there. I really like what Grace Zabriskie brings to the character in The Return, especially. I think that Fire Walk With Me, especially some of the deleted material, she's really good. I am left uncertain about certain asp uncertain about certain <laughs> it's it's very late when I'm recording this and I am I'm quite tired so pardon my uh, my speaking but um, I, I I really do quite like a lot of what Grace Zabriskie brings even as I'm uncertain as I was trying to say about the return with the potential demon lurking within her at first I was worried that was kind of turning her into a villain and turning her into a demon and I think you can still interpret it that way and I don't like that. I don't like making her out to be as evil or more evil than Bob and Leland. At the same time, if I look at the presence in her as suffering and trauma and that it's like instead of the Garmambosia being feasted off of other people, like Leland and Bob would go after other targets to get the Garmambosia. And maybe the Garmambosia was also harvested through Leland's guilt over Laura and things like that. Sarah is like a perpetual energy of Garmambosia. Just this like person who's been devastated, stuck in place, stuck on loop, isolated, and that this entity inside of her might be feeding off of that sort of um, darkness within her. Uh, notably, Sarah Palmer is not looking for victims. Um, at least not for sure. She goes to the bar to get a drink, but she actively does not want that guy to mess with her. And when he continues, he gets what's coming to him through through uh, her ripping off her face for that demon. But I don't see her as necessarily this predator the way that Leland was. So I, I think that she, even, even when we have the demon inside of her, Sarah becomes a, a, a less evil character and more of this really horribly tragic one. And I think a testament to how ill-equipped Twin Peaks was as a community to support her following the tragedy. Like, no one wanted to see what was underneath the surface. No one wanted to see the horror of Twin Peaks, what it really could be, what Laura was living through day in and day out. No one wanted to see that. Then when it was exposed, everyone collectively looked away. Because I remember in, like, season two being like, wait, did, did people even find out that Leland was the killer? And it seems like they did. It seems like that is knowledge that, yes, Leland was the killer, but the town kind of just waved it away. And then maybe, maybe I'm missing something, but it feels like a lot of characters weren't really equipped to handle the reality of what Leland had done. And instead of really coming together as a community to help Sarah, she ended up alone. And I think part of it might be by her own design, too, because I think that she doesn't want Hawk around because there might be a sense in which she knows only pain comes to those who are around her, that she might be someone who is gifted and damned. So again, even just the fact that there's so much you can say about her, I think is really interesting. And yeah, I need to put her above Pete, don't I? Yeah, above Jacoby, above Annie, above Chad, above Catherine. Above Nadine, probably there, but it's very close because Audrey has some low points. But I, I, yeah, I have to move her ahead the more I think about it, the more I talk about it. So again, all of this is super subjective. All of this is subject to change as I just keep thinking about things. Shelly Johnson, I quite like. I would say I like her probably more than Albert. I'll, I'll put her there. I I don't think that she has a sort of complicated character. I think she's pretty simple. But I think that Machen and Mech does a really good job translating the emotions of this character, whether it's in the fear with Leo, the sort of complex passion and frustration with Bobby at points. The uh, Those two main connections are what we see, but also with Norma. Um, there's some great comedy bits as well, like the the part where she's imitating Leland jumping on the casket after the funeral. Um, she just got some really charming moments that I think are worth uh, worth highlighting. I think she's just a fun performance throughout, and yeah, I just I like what she does. It's it's sad that in the return she's kind of regressed in some ways to be with Red. At least that's the potential implication is regress, but I think in the original series she's quite good. Sheriff Cable is pretty manufactured for a purpose, but I do like him. Uh, I think I'll put him 
probably there, I guess, separating uh, the two moms. Uh, he's a fun character. He's got an interesting fight sequence in the deleted uh, missing pieces. He's got an interesting slow cadence to the way he talks. It's uh, it's fun for what it definitely is. Steven the Manufactured for a Purpose, but I have less to say about him. The performance is actually good, but I find that the writing could have been much more developed. I, I would have wanted to get more of a sense of what he is. So I'm going to put him... Yeah, uh, below Sunny Jim for me personally. Sylvia Horn. Hmm. I, I guess I'll put her next to the other moms. I think she has more of identity than Eileen, with especially the return bringing her back. Uh, she feels kind of like a forgotten element of the original show. Uh, I'm glad that David Lynch brought her back to witness the Ben Horn and Dr. Hayward finale. Tammy is going into D tier for me and is going in the last place. I think that Tammy is probably the least interesting character in Twin Peaks. And it's really unfortunate because I think she was being set up as potentially very interesting. The secret history gave her this sort of introduction to a lot of the case files and materials of what was going on in Twin Peaks and the supernatural aspects. And in Final Dossier, she's got a bit of a personality back. But in the return itself, I do not sense that personality at all. In fact, I'm not even sure I could identify any personality trait on Tammy other than a baseline level of um, curious because she's, you know, investigating things. But when Gordon Cole says that she has the stuff, I don't really know what that means. And it's unfortunate, again, because she could have been, you know, quote unquote, the new Dale Cooper. She could have been the new FBI investigator who was clearly set up in secret history. So I, I just, I find myself wanting something out of her character and really not getting anything. A lot of times she's just awkwardly there following Albert and Gordon Cole, who do almost all the work. She occasionally gets to look through some files, which you know, visually consists of her just looking back and forth between like papers. She doesn't get a lot of standout moments beyond that. And I think that's very unfortunate. The tea kettle, uh, coffee pot, whatever it's supposed to be, supposedly not a tea kettle is being put here as a separate character. I don't, I, th I think it's a bold choice right? Implying that they're different characters. I am just going to put it next to next to Jeffries though, because I mean, I'm assuming it is still the same guy. I'm going to assume that that's still the same entity inside there. Like if we're considering Diane to be the same Diane, whether it's the Tulpa or not, and we're considering Dougie to be the same, whether it's Dougie Cooper versus Dougie Jones before, if we're considering those to be the same character, I think that these two are just the same character in my mind then too. I think that... Teresa Banks is manufactured for a purpose. I'm going to put her, I don't know, next to next to there. Maybe admittedly below like the spike and below Maddie. Now I'm thinking about it, I'm probably going to lower Ronette as well and do it that way I think is, is probably fair. I think having these three next to each other as the three victims of Leland is kind of telling in a way. I think that Laura stands out so much more than these less developed characters that I think that that's a fair take. The man for their place. Ooh, that's tough. He is so synonymous with Twin Peaks. Uh, did they put the tree? They put the tree as a separate character. That's going with him, in my opinion. And it's tough because Michael J. Anderson, uh, from what I was reading, may or may not have said some things that are very bad and uh, not a fan of, of some of the off-screen uh, remarks. That being said, again, kind of like with Bob, this is a very quintessential character, very importantly defined. And I'm going to put him then at the head of this. I think that that's probably the best I can do. I, um, I really like some of the stuff we get visually with this character. The Let's Rock is an iconic line. The Gum You Like is iconic. The sort of menace of this character occasionally, the weird shuffling, um, there's some good stuff going on, definitely. And the evolution um, is a great looking tree with a piece of gum at the top. I, I really enjoy that dendrite looking thing. <laughs> the, the jumping man, um, <laughs> should I be cheeky and put that right next to Sarah Palmer? I think I will. 
because there's indications, depending on how you view the return, with potentially Grace Zabriskie's face over that mask, where I'm just going to put them next to each other and assume that people are going to nod and smile that they're the same character. If we're not doing that, I would immediately lower the jumping man into manufactured for a purpose and probably put that, I don't know, above Steven or something. So I'll just put him there for now. Thomas Eckert, I do think is a bit stronger than Andrew Packard, but not by enough to really draw much of a distinction. He is set up as this potentially big bad, but I think he kind of looks like the butt of a joke at the end of the day. He might have had the last laugh with the bomb, but I think Josie outshined him as a character. So I'm just going to put him there as I'm a bit divided. Vivian was completely turned into a monster in the final dossier. Even there's a little show, though, she was already not a good person. Decidedly very antagonistic. I'm going to say divided as well, although I am going to put her probably there. Um, I think that's fair. The Milkman is very funny. I really enjoy the season two premiere. That is really his time to shine other than the one in the same remark in the season two finale. I think he may have been also in the Maddie killing episode at the roadhouse, but don't quote me on that. Could be mistaken. I, I think um, he's going to go above the Chalfont Tremond, but not as good as the experiment. I'll, I'll put him there. Is he as good as the experiment? I don't know. Is he as funny as the experiment is horrifying? Is a really tough conundrum. I think any day of the day of the week, I might switch these around, but around, but uh, I'll, I'll leave them there. Wally Brando is very much manufactured for a purpose. Um, probably funnier than Harriet, though, so I'll put him there. Doctor Hayward. Oh boy, I am so tough. This is so. This is so tough. So Dr. Hayward is a character that I vehemently disagree with in a lot of ways. He is portrayed to be a good father and a generally decent guy, and I think that's the way I'm supposed to feel about him. But the way in which he obstructs Albert from doing the autopsy, very understandable autopsy in a murder case, and he tries to like fight Albert over that, that's awful. The way that he tries to hide the truth from his daughter about her parentage when she's 18, an adult, and wants to know. That's awful. And then <laughs> launching Ben into the fireplace, even if you take it the most charitable of interpretations that it was a complete accident and completely impulsive, um, not a good move. Like, Benjamin Horn, definitely a bad guy. He's, he's, he's led to a lot of people's demises, so I'm not going to say Ben's innocent here. But in that moment... I don't like that Dr. Hayward was doing that. Uh, so I find myself disagreeing there. And then in Final Dossier, he basically leaves his family, covers up all of the stuff that happened with, with Ben, and loses touch with everyone for like 20 years until Donna reaches out. And I just look at Dr. Hayward, maybe unfairly, depending on your interpretation. I look at Dr. Hayward as like emblematic of the problems of Twin Peaks. He is someone who is always covering up the truth, always trying to smooth over the truth. And it feels like he's never really reckoning with the actual situations. Instead, he'd rather just like bury it. I don't like that. That being said... He is such an interesting character then for me to talk about, and I find myself fixated on his character because he kind of represents that to me. So I have to say that I like him, right? Like, I have to say that I, he means more to me than, like, Ed. He means more to me than Lucy and Andy. I mean, by all accounts, he means more to me than Jeffrey's. So I'm going to put him uneasily by uh, by Jacques here. And it's not because I enjoy him. It's because I hate him. <laughs> and, and of course, I, I'm referring to the character here. I think that Warren Frost did, you know, did a good job with the performance. And it was, it was nice to be able to see him through the Skype call, even if that was weird. We got to see the very cool desk that Frank Truman has in the return as a result. But... I, my, my, my problems are with the character's actions, but that doesn't mean he's poorly written. It just means I, I want to have a bone to pick with him, you know? It means that I think he's the, the endgame antagonist of Twin Peaks. Uh, very silly, I'm sure, to a lot of people, but I, I do feel that way in, in a large, large degree. Uh, I missed earlier, but manufacture the purpose is uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, evil Abraham Lincoln. Got a light. Um, he's pretty cool. He's probably cooler than Wally Brando, so I'm going to put him there. 
Bill Hastings is completely made by the fact that they got the casting that they got. I think that Matthew Lillard was killing it with what he was given. Uh, Scooby diving is a very funny comment uh, for, for meta textual reasons. And I think that he elevated what could have been a really forgettable character to something much better. Like I'm just realizing his wife wasn't even on here. Um, and she's like literally the reason that manufactured for a purpose is on this list. So I'm going to put bill in the liking category, but in the very lowest, um, it feels weird to even have him technically above Donna in that way. But I, I think that his actual like performance was really fun. So I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put him there. And then Wyndham Earl, I like more than maybe other people do. I know that his character can get a bit cartoony, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that, um, in fact, it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to put him, yeah, I'm going to put him there. I, uh, I, I, I think with Harold, it's, it's very close. But I think Wyndham Earl is just a lot of fun. I think that his um, over-the-top sort of presentation of evil really works to drive season two to its conclusion. And then David Lynch very masterfully uh, handles Wyndham Earl in the season two finale to kind of bring a darkness to him with the, the rainbow trout remark going through the darkness of the woods. The scenes in the Red Room involving him are great. Ultimately, I think he was a pawn of much greater forces. He thought he was going to go into the Black Lodge and gain all this power, but he was less than nothing. I think he was a lure. He was a lure to bring in someone like Dale Cooper into the Lodge, I ultimately think. And maybe Annie too, in that regard, was brought in that way to bring Cooper into the Lodge. But I, I really enjoy his dressing up, his antics. I think that... The interplay with him and um, both Major Briggs and Leo Johnson was really good. I think that even though we don't get a lot of on-screen stuff between him and Dale Cooper, that was quite good as well. So I'm, I'm going to say that, yeah, he's, he's, he's damn good. And that wraps up all the Twin Peaks characters. Again, this is brought to you by Kerbleru. And I will have the link to this tier list in the description. Okay, last minute, changing my mind. I'm looking at this more. I, I literally stopped recording and then like looked at it more and I'm like, no, I need to change something. I think that I need to be moving more of the things in B into A. So I'm going to put, just for right now, um, the Arm, Hawk, the Mitchum Brothers, Sean Renault. Put them here. And I think also Shelly. This is probably all still accurate, although I think I am overrating Chad a bit. I'm going to put Chad here, and then I'm also going to maybe move Catherine behind Pete and maybe behind the... Again, this is all completely subjective. I could change my mind in a week, but I wanted to put this out there for anyone interested to hear like a long form rambly ranking of all these characters. If I had to kind of like sum this all up, I think most Twin Peaks characters that are given pretty good development are interesting. I think there's only a few that I would consider either like a misstep or a bit of a dud. Um, and, and the B category is, is maybe the largest here. Um, but even the characters in B territory are still very enjoyable. It's still a positive rating. I still like seeing them on the screen. And the fact that I have this many S tiers, I'm someone who's usually pretty conservative with my S tiers. I don't put a lot of S tiers out there for most media that I like. The fact that there's this many on here, and I could even make a case for putting Hank, Bob, and Harold in S tier if I really wanted to, uh, says a lot, I think, about the quality of the character writing on Twin Peaks, which I think is some of the best in all of television history. I, I obviously have my biases and preferences. Someone who loves the return might rank things very differently than me, and that is 100% okay. So please let me know in the comments if there are certain characters that you have a different take on or you agree with and kind of what your thoughts are. And for those just tuning in who may not have listened to our podcast, uh, I go by Khalil, 
and we just wrapped up very recently our wonderful and strange Twin Peaks logcast. It's like 78 episodes, super long, but it goes through all of Twin Peaks. It goes from the very beginning to like all the supplementary material, like the like literally collectible cards, the unofficial, official, unofficial, uh, fan, not fan uh, publication, the Twin Peaks Gazette. Um, we also do all the David Lynch films. We go through all the special features. It's it's a lot. It is thorough. And I did this with my friend, the Uncle Professor, who had never seen the show before. So you get to have this whole expanse of someone experiencing it for the first time. So if that's something that interests you, again, that's on this channel. It's also on Spotify, Google, Apple, wherever. Again, it's the Twin Peaks Wonderful and Strange Twin Peaks Logcast. Uh, I'm also going to be uploading more Twin Peaks material, some a lot more structured than this, more essay type, and then some maybe that's a little looser, more casual, like this was Uh, and that's going to be over on this channel so if you want to hit the subscribe button that'd be great appreciate it likes and shares are also appreciated i'm a small channel i'm kind of niche within a niche and uh, i think that it's fun to share these opinions so if you enjoy please let me know thank you so much for tuning in and um beware the owls are not what they seem so until next time ciao